it's 9.30 a.m. and today is Tuesday, August 11th. My name is Brian Zumwalt and I'm the director of the county's Office of Technology and Innovation. I'll be playing the role of technology moderator for today's virtual meeting. On the panel with me is Don Crow from the county attorney's office. He'll be sitting in for Jewel White today as county attorney and also serving as process moderator. Uh, before we start this meeting, I'd like to do a quick roll call and ensure that we have adequate communications for each commissioner. Uh, let's go ahead and start with Commissioner Eggers. I'm here th uh, this morning. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Seal. Good morning. Good morning. Commissioner Welch. Good morning, Brian. Good morning, sir. Commissioner Long. Good morning. I'm here. Good morning. All right, Commissioner Justice. Good morning, Brian. Good morning. Commissioner Peters. Good morning, Brian. Good morning. Commissioner Gerard is not with us, which means that Commissioner Eggers is serving as chair. So, Mr. Chairman, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate that this morning. Again, welcome everybody to the uh, August 11th commission meeting, regular commission meeting this morning. And just a couple of things wanted to get out of the way. Um, we will be having uh, public hearings first, then we'll go to public comments. And again, those public comments, just to remind everybody, will be on any item that is not on the agenda. Later in the agenda, under uh, uh, the when we do the emergency call, um, that's when we'll be talking anything related to pandemic. We'll also be t going to residents on any item as we vote on any item throughout the agenda. So just uh, just want to make sure that that was clear for everybody. I just wanted, again, to take the opportunity to thank our amazing residents for the work that they're doing and the efforts and sacrifices that they're going through during this tough time. Uh, again, our thoughts, our prayers are with the families that are struggling uh, with financially and with health and people who who they may have lost. So always want to keep those folks uh, forefront in our minds and in our hearts. Also, just a real quick thanks to staff for everything that they've been doing, uh, rising above and beyond and just doing a great job. All of our municipal partners, our community partners, and our state partners. Um, and just a real quick special thanks to our Pinellas County Behavioral Health System of Care and Barbara Dare. She had a great meeting yesterday. Um, really informative. There's some really good things that are happening there, but I just wanted to thank her for keeping that group going together during these times as well. So with that, we'll go straight to the public hearings. And I know we have one countywide planning authority, Jeanette, uh, from the clerk's office. Sure. Good morning. Um, item number one is the second of two public hearings regarding a proposed ordinance amending the countywide rules relating to the residential rule and residential very low land use categories. The public hearing was properly advertised and the affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received. The matter is properly before the authority to be heard. Hey, Barry, do, you, yes. do we have anybody that can just give a brief, just a brief presentation on this? I don't think we had one last time and just thought it might be a good idea just to Yes, Give Lynn me. Fisher's on the line, so Brian can promote her up. Okay, great. Good morning. Hi, Linda, is that you? That is me. Hi there, thank you. Welcome. <laughs> great. Um, okay, well, as you all uh, recall, uh, in late February, the board uh, passed a resolution making a request to add the uh, residential rural category to the countywide rules. Um, Brian, could we go to the next slide, please? Um, and this is a process that any local government can follow to request a text amendment to the countywide rules. Um, next slide, please. Um, residential rural is a category that we used to have in, in the rules uh, before 2015. The countywide plan map was an identical compilation of all the local future land use maps. And any amendment to a local map automatically triggered a countywide plan map amendment. Um, there were nine residential categories, including residential rural at one half unit per acre and residential estate at one unit per acre. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in 2015, the countywide plan consolidated those nine categories into four. Uh, and as part of that process, residential rural and residential estate were replaced by a new residential very low category at one unit per acre. Next slide. Um, what that means is if a local government uh, amends their countywide, uh, excuse me, amends their future land use map from residential rural to residential estate, uh, it no longer triggers a countywide plan map amendment because our category remains residential very low in both cases. And the purpose of that consolidation in general was to recognize that um, not every minor local amendment rises to the level of countywide significance. 
and that we could allow some amendments to go forward with just local approval. Um, it's been five years since we made that change. Uh, most of the categories have worked pretty smoothly, uh, but um, of course, as you know, the, the county has identified a problem with residential very low. Uh, just to recap for those who might not be familiar, uh, unincorporated Pinellas County has a number of low density communities which are protected from density increases through community overlays adopted into the unincorporated uh, county comprehensive plan. One of those areas is in the North County adjacent to Tarpon Springs in an area known as East Lake Tarpon. That overlay was adopted in 2012. It spans about 13,000 acres. Um, nearly 30% of the parcel acreage is residential rural on the county's future land use maps, but there have been some recent annexations uh, by Tarpon Springs where the property owners have amended to the new residential very low category afterward. So that essentially doubles uh, the density from one half to one unit per acre. And under the current countywide plan, that density increase can happen with, with just city approval. And that's happened with 46... <laughs> That's happened uh, with 46 acres and two annexations within the last three years. Uh, the largest of those happened this year. That was the uh, North Lake Pioneer Homes Amendment uh, that was 43 acres. Uh, and that, that really was the event that triggered a lot of community concern. Uh, so from the county's perspective, these amendments are undermining the integrity of the community overlays. Uh, and in order to protect those communities, the board has requested to readopt the residential rural category into the countywide rules. And once that's done, to apply it to the countywide plan map uh, in the East Lake Tarpon area. So that will require future amendments from residential rural to residential very low to get countywide approval in addition to local approval. Um, now, the rules amendment and the map amendment are, are two different actions that have to be done in sequence. So the ordinance before you today is just for the text amendment to put the category back in the rules. And once that's finalized, we will follow up with processing the request for the map amendment. Next slide, please. Um, the proposed amendment has a few parts. Of course, it includes the new category standards. Uh, it includes a, a process for a new process for this type of amendment because we'll be amending just the countywide plan map without a corresponding future land use map amendment. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we also took the opportunity to clean up a, a few typos and inconsistencies that we found after the last major update in October. That's not an uncommon thing to happen for an amendment of that size, uh, but these are just uh, non-substantive housekeeping amendments. Next slide, please. Um, on May 4th, the Planners Advisory Committee voted unanimously to recommend approval of the rules amendment. The Forward Pinellas Board recommended approval on May 13th with only the representative from Tarpon Springs uh, not voting in favor. And then today in your capacity as a countywide planning authority, uh, you'll be voting on final approval um, assuming you do approve it, then we'll follow up with the map amendment and we anticipate that that would be finalized by October 6th. Next slide, please. That is my very brief presentation. And <laughs> if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank, thank you, Linda. I really appreciate that. Uh, are there any uh, questions from the board? I can't see everybody, Brian, but I'm assuming not. I don't think we have any, Commissioner Eggers. Uh, then we'll uh, we'll go to the public and see if there's any any comments from the public. Okay, at this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on agenda item number one, uh, please raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting or hit star nine if you're on the telephone. And Mr. Chairman, it doesn't look like we have anybody that wants to speak on this. All right, thank you, Brian. Uh, mm -hmm. Then uh, do I have a motion for approval, please? So no, approval. Uh, who said that first? Uh, Charlie, was that you? No, it was me. All right. I'll do the second, Commissioner, Mr. Chairman. Okay. All right. I have a motion and a second. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, everybody. All right. We'll move on to item number two, Jeanette. Sure. Um, item number two is an ordinance establishing Chapter 42, Article 15, of the Pinellas County Code related to an infectious disease elimination program, including syringe exchange. The public hearing was properly advertised. The affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondences have been received. The matter is properly before the board to be heard. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, does uh, any of the um, anybody want to have the uh, uh, presentation, or do we just want to go? Yes, to we have a, we have a presentation from Dr. Cho. On the, oh, and this perfect. is the first time this is the first time you've heard this, so I, it would be appropriate. And there's some comments and questions. I know the sheriff would like to speak on it. Oh, great. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Brian. Okay. Um, Brian, uh, I'm going to also ask uh, uh, Gail Gaidesh and uh, Diane Clark to speak on this as well, uh, if you can promote them as well. Okay. Uh, uh, specifically about the parameters. But, uh, Commissioners, good morning, everybody. Um, obviously, uh, given our health care situation, our primary focus has been with uh, COVID. Um, but uh, with the hospitals and um, DOH sort of prioritizing some of the health issues in the community, um, the topics of mental health and uh, uh, substance abuse has always been uh, one of our top priorities here in our community. Um, and certainly the opioid epidemic uh, did not stop uh, because of, the, of COVID. It's still an ongoing thing and in some degrees has, has gotten worse as a result. Uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, the, uh, the uh, Infectious Disease Elimination Act uh, that was passed by the Florida legislature about a year and a half now. Um, to uh, better address that issue, uh, and, but also focus on preventing bloodborne pathogens and other infections. And at this time, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Gail Gaidesh, who is the assistant director here at the health department, um, and who has also been instrumental in the opioid task force to really talk about the specifics and the language of that uh, disease, um, Infectious Disease Elimination Act. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Cho. And I'm also here to give Dr. Cho a little bit of a break because he's been presenting quite a few times to your uh, board. So I want to give you an opportunity to hear from someone else. So Brian, if you could advance the slide, please. So uh, like Dr. Cho said, um, there was an act that was signed into law and it's called IDEA or the Infectious Disease Elimination Act. That was in 2016 with which it was signed into law in the state of Florida. And what it did is it allowed for a five year pilot program in Miami-Dade County in order to offer a syringe exchange program. So what they did is they basically piloted the program and its intention is to prevent bloodborne disease transmission because as you're aware, if, uh, if people share needles, they also share blood and then they share their bloodborne pathogens. So the intention was to provide needle exchange, a clean needle for a dirty needle in order to prevent this disease transmission. For that particular act, um, it was authorized until 2021 or until the Miami-Dade County Commission was be able to pass the ordinance. Next slide, please. So uh, the successes for Miami-Dade thus far, um, and just for the first two years of its operation, they provided more than 600 HIV and more than 500 hepatitis C tests to this uh, population, specifically to this population. And since then, they have almost doubled all those numbers. So they're providing all these tests for free in order to um, let people know their status. Uh, for this particular population, they're not necessarily ones that would seek health care. And for those of you that know a little bit about HIV, it is very important for people to know their status. Because if we know their status, we can also help them find treatment and reduce their viral load, which will again help prevent disease transmission. So it's very important. Um, another part of the program is to provide naloxone. And uh, between March and January of 2020, they passed out almost 3,000 boxes of naloxone. Now, anecdotally, their opioid deaths also decreased. I wouldn't say it was causal, but I will say it's causal because, you know, having people have the naloxone uh, when they don't have as a robust EMS system as we do, it's really dangerous because they're out in the community. They're doing things where they don't want to be found, and it's important for them to have naloxone in their uh, community where they can use it. So next slide, please. So the expansion bill came into law in 2019, signed by Governor DeSantis, and it allows any county commission in the state to authorize a syringe exchange program, or what we call an SEP. Um, the ordinance is the initial part of this whole process. Um, we do know that in the ordinance, it says that state, county, or municipal funds cannot be used for these exchange programs. They have to use grants, donations, or anything else. And even federal dollars, which can be used, you cannot use them to purchase the needles themselves. So it's a very, um, uh, as it's a prescriptive program. And I will say for this particular ordinance, the entire ordinance is very prescriptive 
prescriptive, but it is also only a skeleton. Because I want you to be aware that the ordinance is the first step, but there's a lot more steps that have to happen before any other program is, is involved. There's a procurement process. There's a lot that has to be done. Next slide, please. So the responsibilities that are, are in process of this particular program, there's three main entities that have to be involved. The first one is the county commission and the subsequent county uh, staff that have to help along. The actual person that operates the program or the syringe exchange program and the Department of Health that provides the advice and the consultation. And that's why we're here today, because as disease experts, we're here to, to help you understand why this particular program may be important. Next slide, please. So I'm going to go through a little bit of the program responsibilities and allow you just to see an overview. But again, the ordinance is a skeleton. The actual program could take up to a year to implement because it's going to be important for us to do this slowly and correctly if it is uh, approved. So again, the, the county commission has to provide the ordinance and they have to agree to the ordinance if they see fit. Uh, they have to enter into a letter of agreement with the Department of Health, and that's actually the State Department of Health. All ordinances in all counties have to agree with the ordinance uh, language that's in the letter, and it's provided in your, pa in your packet today. And then furthermore, you uh, enlist the county health department to do all of your ongoing operational advice, which is what you're used to doing as far as public health and disease control matters. Next slide, please. So the county commission using the ordinance can only contract, and that's with the staff and the procurement process, contract with one of these particular entities. No other entity outside of this can do this particular program. And it's it's specific in a way to take the people that can actually handle this type of program and this type of process, because there's a lot of more prescriptive things that they have to do. Next slide, please. So there's the actual operator or the syringe exchange program person group or entity, they have to follow very strict guidelines. And, and the county commission and the county staff can actually be very prescriptive of what they want. And the ultimate goal of this is only a one-to-one -one needle and syringe exchange. You cannot bring in 10 dirty needles and get 100. It has to be one for one. Um, the Miami-Dade data that they have provided, they actually have taken in less need, they have taken in more needles than they have passed out. So that's good news that actually the dirty needles are coming off the street. The danger of needle sticks are off. So it's important for people to pull them in and get them uh, put into the waste stream that needs to be. Um, each of the programs have to have oversight and accountability, including site security. You can't just have things left out for people to take. It's very important that they document how many they have, how many they get, and how many they passed out. And they also have to do, which is the most important part of this program, is the HIV and the hepatitis screening. If they are not able to do the hepatitis screening on site, they have to refer and the person has to be able to get into some type of testing within 72 hours. Um, part of the really um, unique uh, issue with this particular program is in Miami, they've said that they've gotten to some folks that normally don't seek treatment and normally don't use systems. So part of the real important part of this program is be able to link people to care and link people to treatment, link them to services, because really the end game is not the needle exchange. The end game is to get them to be a healthy individual. Next slide, please. Furthermore, again, the drug abuse prevention, education, and treatment, which is why Operation PAR is on the, the call today to talk about that important part, because, again, we know that they're in crisis, they're doing drugs, and we want them to not do this forever. That's the whole point of making this touch point for these individuals. Um, the uh, Narcan or the naloxone kits are part of the process, so that is part of the exchange. And the data collection, they cannot just do this willy-nilly. They actually have to document um, what they have, what they've given out, and how they are, in are ensuring that people are actually seeking treatment or seeking some type of, of really getting their needs uh, assessed and addressed. Next slide. So as far as the Department of Health is concerned, we are tasked with collecting all the data from all the operators and reporting it to the state, which also goes to the governor, and making sure that the program, any type of uh, consultation and anything that they need, we can help with. Because again, it's the disease prevention. So it's really important for us to be able to um, assist with the start of the program as well as once it is to, to go further. So I think 
uh, like I said, the, the skeleton of the, uh, the ordinance is very important, but I think really sitting down and thinking through how we would want this program to be achieved and really more of a countywide effort, not necessarily, we do need the operators to do the program, but not thinking it similarly just for one individual, but thinking it as a countywide program. Because again, we don't wanna have it done one way in one particular provider and another way, another provider. And a lot of our providers actually could work together and make this a really great effort. Next slide. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Cho, who is uh, very uh, astute at all the data and you're used to hearing that. So I'll let him handle the uh, important part of the disease control prevention part. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Um, I'd like to touch on the sort of and highlight the burden of the disease and the consequences of IV drug use as well as opioid use overall. Um, here you can see some of our trends and unfortunately we are increasing in terms of death. Now this is all, all uh, drug related deaths um, and you can see over the last uh, five years from 15 to 19 we've had a 136 percent increase. Um, and in 2020, a year to date, uh, we did uh, see an increase in May and uh, in June as well. Um, next slide. Looking specifically at opioid related death, you can also see similarly that, that there has been an increase over that five year span with 145% increase from 15 to 19. Um, the, the predominant, and this is uh, from uh, what Rita sort of presented to us the other day, uh, has shifted to a fentanyl um, away from synthetic fentanyls um, and to what she's seeing in terms of seizures, in terms of deaths, uh, there is no signs of slowing down, unfortunately. Next slide. Um, looking at the sort of the emergency uh, department trends, uh, it sort of mirrors that trend. So you can see this uh, trend over the last two and a half years. Uh, there has been a 261% increase um, over that time span, and which also mirrors the 911 EMS transports as well. Um, and this year, uh, in terms of the 911 transports, um, we have seen an increase this past year. Um, and in terms of 911 transport requiring a Narcan, that's the antidote for opioids, um, it administered increased in May and June as well. So sort of mirroring, unfortunately, those deaths uh, trends. Uh, next slide. So uh, obviously one of the primary focus with the, the uh, act is to sort of prevent the secondary consequences of these bloodborne pathogens, notably uh, chronic uh, hepatitis C. Um, you can see here that the numbers in themselves have improved over the last few years, but uh, clearly we're still seeing well over a, um, a thousand cases here in our county, new cases of chronic hepatitis C uh, on an annual basis, keeping in mind that 60% of he hepatitis C is a result of IV drug use. Uh, there has been some studies uh, looking at the syringe exchange programs and how it would benefit some of those trends. And there are some studies that indicate that those uh, participating uh, in uh, these types of programs, uh, there is a 50% reduction in new HIV and hepatitis C cases. Next slide. So with hepatitis A, it's not purely a bloodborne pathogen, uh, but it does also denote sort of the high risk types of behaviors. And as you're probably all aware, we did see a huge outbreak in Pinellas County in 2019. Uh, from uh, uh, the beginning of 2018 to, to July of this year, uh, we saw 495 cases. And um, unfortunately, that number has improved this year with only four cases reported in 2020 and largely due uh, to our vaccination efforts and our community uh, collaboration. But with, even with hepatitis A, uh, the, one of the risk factors uh, um, described with these cases were drug use. 55% uh, of those uh, diagnosed with hepatitis A reported drug use and 36% uh, had reported uh, IV drug use at some point. Next slide. Um, in terms of HIV, um, it's IV drug use uh, um, uh, does, uh, uh, um, is responsible for 7% of the new cases, so not a huge number. However, uh, um, as you may be also aware that uh, Pinellas was identified as part of the ND HIV epidemic. Uh, what this is, this is a CDC program where they identified um, communities which accounted to over 50% of the new HIV cases nationally. So what that program uh, described and outlined was 48 counties, uh, Washington, D.C., uh, Puerto Rico, and seven southern states that accounted for that percentage. Pinellas is one of the seven uh, Florida counties that were identified as part of the epidemic. And we did get some funding as a result of, of the, those efforts. Um, and our focus is gonna be looking at the health disparity aspect of it. 
uh, with 42% of our cases coming from our African American community. So working on efforts in terms of education, in terms of access to testing. So that will be ongoing. One of the benefits, again, as uh, Gail mentioned with the uh, syringe exchange program is that it does provide that, air, uh, that point, uh, to a touch point to test for hepatitis as well as HIV. And then ultimately, if they are diagnosed, uh, a linkage to care uh, really per, uh, preventing that further spread. And, and CDC studies still note that one in six or one in seven people that have HIV do not realize they have HIV and is unknowingly spreading into a community. Um, so with that, uh, not, next slide. I'll, uh, with that, this is my last slide here. I'll turn it over to Diane Clark, who's the CEO of Operation PAR, also co-chairs the Opioid Task Force. She is also the subject matter extra as it, come, uh, as it pertains to addiction, um, as well as medication assisted therapy. Uh, so just uh, for any uh, final thoughts, Diane. And Diane, you'll have to unmute yourself. How's that? That's better. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you for considering this important um, ordinance for our county. As Dr. Cho said, we're co-chairs together of the Opioid Task Force, and um, I've been doing this work since 1980, and I want to advocate for your support for this or ordinance that would align uh, Pinellas County with the current state law. It's an important step to reach folks um, in need. Uh, the CDC reports that people with opioid use disorder are more likely to die than other, age, other folks in their own age group from diseases such as HIV, Hep C, and infections like endocarditis. But people who have access to syringe exchange programs are more likely to enter treatment and reduce their IV drug use. People who use a syringe program are five times more likely to enter treatment and even those who just inject drugs and use the syringe program are three times as likely to report a reduction in their um, intravenous frequency. This ordinance gives us the opportunity to reach people who need services that we're not reaching now. Rita Newman um, reported just yesterday that Pinellas County is on track to have more than 500 deaths from, over, from overdose this calendar year. And in the last two months have seen 60 people each month die when it was 30 a month last year, this same time. Two people a day are dying from overdose, not only from opioids, but from cocaine and amphetamines as well. We know this is a national trend and the US expects to see the sharpest increase of overdose deaths since 2016. This is due to the current social isolation, changes in the drug supply, and we know that during times of economic downturns, more overdose deaths occur. This ordinance would allow our community to build on the outreach efforts that you have funded, such as the naloxone distribution for the homeless and those at high risk of overdose through the Homeless Overdose Mitigation and Engagement Program, the HOME program as it's called. It would allow us to bring health and behavioral health partners together for a robust program and to continue to develop a comprehensive system of care for our community. Every visit to a syringe exchange program is a chance for intervention and to help people make healthy changes in behavior. It gives the opportunity to educate people about preventing overdose, avoiding syringe sharing, and how to access physical health and disease prevention services. Every visit has a life-saving potential through distribution of naloxone and referral to treatment and to reach those that we have not been able to previously reach. And I just wanna leave you with this, that treatment is effective. And the Surgeon General reports uh, called Facing Addiction in America lets us know that more than 25 million people with a, with a previous substance use disorder are in remission. That's 25 million people are in remission and living healthy, productive lives. And so I urge you to consider passing this ordinance so that we can help even more people live a life in recovery. Thank you, Diane. That, that, was, uh, that was really a, a great report. Um, Barry, did, did, uh, is there anybody else? Did the sheriff want uh, to weigh yes, in? Uh, well, the sheriff's on the line and uh, Lourdes is on the line also. The, uh, the, there's, a, there's a few key things and the sheriff brought up a couple of concerns he had. Um, I know you were able to talk to Dr. Cho last week uh, regarding those. 
Um, but there's a couple steps that have that need to occur here. So one is the ordinance, the other is the, the contract. So we'll have to issue contracts for anybody providing it. Um, Sheriff raised two concerns to me, one being the, that it's a one-to-one -one exchange, um, and two, that he was concerned about the mobile unit. That's another criteria that we put within the contracting, that it's a brick and mortar location. So, um, but those can be handled by contract um, versus within the ordinance. But again, um, all those, Sheriff, feel free, or anybody else uh, regarding how we move forward and structure uh, this program. You want me to? Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Sheriff. Okay, all right, thanks. Good morning, everybody. Um, just, just by way of history with this, I've been involved in this issue for four or five years uh, in my role as chair in the legislative committee for the Florida Sheriff's Association. This bill was brought forward in the Florida legislature uh, over a couple of year period. And uh, frankly, we killed it uh, because they were trying to model it too much after the Miami-Dade program. Uh, I worked with Dr. Tukes uh, from the University of Miami Medical School, uh, the folks down in Miami-Dade County, Miami Police Department, et cetera. And we got to a point where it is now uh, where uh, the bill passed and, and we supported it uh, as it passed. There are a couple of extremely, I believe, important uh, provisions uh, that are in the statute. Uh, one of those provisions somehow did not make it into your ordinance. And there's been a lot of discussion here this morning um, about uh, treatment, and I could not uh, agree more uh, with the importance of that. And just to have people be able to exchange needles and syringes without any intervention, without any treatment, without any opportunity to break the cycle of addiction. But for some reason, and I really think that you all should do it, I understand it can uh, be included uh, in a contract, but you know, I, I really puzzled why uh, in the draft ordinance is, is that in uh, the statute, and it's, uh, I'll give you the section number, it's under uh, 381.0038, and it'd be under um, five, uh, where it requires on-site counseling or referrals for drug abuse prevention, education, and treatment. That's omitted from the ordinance. I, I really strongly suggest you need to put that in the ordinance because not having an opportunity for uh, uh, intervention is, is merely just perpetuating the problem. And, and I understand uh, and I get that you're not gonna reach everybody, but there absolutely has to be an effort as opposed to people just coming in and getting syringes and needles and just getting syringes and needles and getting syringes and needles. We need to do something to stop it. And that has to be a, a key component. And some of these organizations, I don't know who you're gonna contract with, but some of these organizations, now Operation PAR is, is, is an example, obviously has counseling and education you know, resources available to it. But if you decide to contract with a medical school, they don't. So you know, it, it depends upon who you contract with. And I, and I think it's really important that it be uh, in the ordinance. The other thing that's not in the ordinance uh, is the requirement that these quote, kits uh, have Narcan or uh, naloxone um, in them. Uh, it's in the statute, but again, it's not in the ordinance. That's less important, but there's a couple things that are omitted. Another thing that I, I really, really feel strongly about <laughs> is, is that you be very specific uh, in the ordinance. Is, and I'll tell you why, that it not contain anything other than what is specifically authorized, and that is uh, the syringe, the needle, and the naloxone. One of the reasons why we oppose this in Miami-Dade County, and I spent time down there, I spent time, again, I spent a lot of effort on this, on this issue, is they were passing out, in essence, heroin starter kits. They weren't just needle exchanges. They were needles, they were syringes, they were cotton balls, they were spoons, they were restricted bands for arms so people could shoot up. These, these kits turned into, in essence, um, uh, facilitator kits so that people could take the drugs. Is, is there's one thing from a health perspective, which I have no problem with, and I support the concept uh, in the nature of in, in the interest of public health, but I don't support these starter kits. And, and I'm concerned, depending upon who is allowed to do it, and again, it's got to be NGOs, non governmental organizations, it can't be government funds, but we really need to make sure that the rules are extremely clear. The other thing that, again, feel very strongly about is because of what we saw in South Florida is, is that it, it needs to be limited to bricks and mortar locations. I really ask that you take out of the ordinance the, uh, pro, uh, the provision that it can be done in mobile units. What was happening in Miami-Dade County is you had these people from the medical school that were in vans driving around to city parks, 
passing out these exchange kits, which were really these starter kits out of the back of vans. And you had medical students that were doing that. I don't want to see that here in Pinellas County. I, I have no problem with it being at a bricks and mortar location and people can come in where you have the counselors, you have the opportunity for treatment and you have the opportunity for the appropriate exchange. But I don't think it should be allowed in a, uh, in a mobile uh, way at all where people can just drive around the county and pass these things out. So those are the, the, the things that I have a concern about. I really think they should be in this ordinance. Uh, yes, there is a next step in the process, um, but let's codify this. Let's solidify it. Let's set the policy for this county in the strongest way possible so that, that it, it, everybody knows what the rules are when they consider this, uh, because there's a number of options for uh, who can do it. Um, but those are those are the concerns I have, and they're based upon spending the last several years uh, with us and, and getting to a point where we're okay with it, knowing that this would come to a county commission and we'd have an opportunity to weigh in before the county commission and that each county could adopt the best practices for the safe, safest way of doing it in their county. And I don't want to see uh, what has happened in, in Miami-Dade County uh, and the way that it was operated down there because I don't agree with it uh, and I saw problems with it. Um, and it operated here in Pinellas in the same way. And I think we need to have the right safeguards in place. So, Commissioner Eggers, um, certainly Dr. Cho can respond I mean, in terms of the, the issues the sheriff raised regarding the ordinance. Um, Lourdes is also on the line. And, uh, she could uh, also. Yeah, Barry, Barry, I've just seen a couple of hands go up. I saw Commissioner Welch and then I saw okay. Commissioner Peters. So, I'm going to let them ask their question now and then oh, Commissioner Long as well. So we'll do Commissioner Welch first and then we'll, we'll circle back around to uh, Dr. Cho. So, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I raised my hand before the sheriff and that added several questions. So I won't hit all those questions. I guess the first one, um, kind of based on what the sheriff just brought up, is there a, a, um, a time limit on this? Is there a date certain this has to be passed? No, Dr. Cho, I defer to you. Dr. Cho's bringing this forward, so I'd ask him. Uh, no, and, and just to give you an example, I know there's a number of counties that have actually passed the ordinance, but they, they've been taking their time um, okay. developing the program. The first step of this process is to get the ordinance, um, and then uh, the next step <coughs> would be both the uh, MOA, uh, MOU with the DOH, uh, uh, and then uh, really coming up with a, uh, getting community partners together, coming up and developing that model here that will work best for us. So. I think we should be methodical. Uh, we need to make it the most effective program we can here for Pinellas County. Okay, and I'd agree with that. We've been talking about this for a while. You know, we've had, I think this came up, we had some folks come to a, a meeting and speak under Citizens to Be Heard, and then we individually met with some folks. Uh, but I think just based on the issues the sheriff brought up, there are several, I think it might be worth a, a workshop or more discussion on it. One, one of the questions I had um, from the previous presentation, just understanding the language, Gail, uh, thank you for your presentation, Gail. You talked about operators with an S, and then our documentation says we have to procure a designated entity, and then some of the ordinance language talks again about an operator. So can you help me understand, are we talking about one administrative entity with multiple operators beneath that? or is it flexible kind of up to how we how we model it? Yeah, depending on the procurement process and how, the, you know, we had a discussion when we met with county staff about, you know, if uh, entities in TOTO come together and group themselves and then provide the different portions and pieces, because like the sheriff said, you know, a medical school would not have the on-site treatment ability. So if there's a way for them to come together with their own MOU, then they could, you know, but again, that would be the legal document and the contract. And, and I think that would be, you know, maybe a best practice instead of having one particular agency doing it, another particular agency doing it, if we, if we build it. And again, I'm, I'm not the builder, I'm just the uh, okay. SME, but maybe have them do it in that way. So it's really more of a countywide system. Okay. And, and then the second question is uh, in section 42, 464C, it talks about having mobile or fixed locations. On the fixed locations part, are the, what are the zoning implications? Where can this fixed location be? Um, is it limited to where a pharmacy could be or commercial or what, what are the restrictions in terms of zoning or um, have we looked at that? 
I'm not aware of any zoning restrictions. Um, when you have uh, sharps, you have to have a biomedical waste permit. So most cl uh, cl clinics, most doctor's offices, all types of providers would have that. It is not my understanding that there is any type of zoning uh, issue. Um, and then the provider would have to, to bring that because it's, it's part of an operation. So I'd, ha I'd defer to the county attorney or anybody else in zoning. Commissioner, I'm not aware that we have looked at that specifically, but obviously uh, it, it has a medical component to it. We can certainly look at that for an actual location, but I think any place that uh, that one of these types of entities operates currently is likely to be appropriate for a fixed location. But, um, but obviously, I mean, residential will be off the table, you would think. Uh, well... The statute does specifically reference also mobile health units. So obviously zoning is not applicable to that um, mm. if, if they are mobile. Uh, so again, I have not looked specifically as to the fixed locations, um, but uh, the statute does say the program may operate at one or more fixed locations or through mobile health units. Okay, and I'm just interested in what parameters we put around the fixed location. Um, and I guess my last question for now is uh, just for uh, um, Dr. Cho and Gail, have y'all have any takeaways from Hillsborough and Manatee? Are, are they fully implemented or what stage are they in? And what can we learn from their experience? Um, I can say that uh, between Miami-Dade, Broward, Leon, Manatee, and Palm Beach, they all have ordinances in place. Palm Beach and Manatee have gone forward with their um, executed letter of agreement with the state, but that's as far as it's gotten. They haven't gotten uh, to the point where they have a productive program yet, only Miami at this time. So uh, they, too, are probably struggling with doing it right. And where is Hillsboro? Um, they have um, the ordinance. Uh, they don't have it uh, resolved yet, but I know that they brought it to the commission, and there were some issues with um, agreeing to it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chair, can I follow up on one thing from Commissioner Walsh's question on the fixed location? Yeah, go ahead, Chair. Just, Commissioner, we, we dealt with this in the legislative process. This was discussed. And, and what you bring up is, is, is a real area of concern because there's nothing in there. And as you're looking at it under three, and it lists the places, it says it has to be uh, under a contract with one of them to operate it. It doesn't say it has to be at that place. And that's the problem. And so same thing with this mobile uh, thing of being able to take it seriously. They, they have, and they will. And they'll take vans and just drive around and pass these things out. But it, it will end up in places, or could end up if they follow that model, could end up in places that are not necessarily these locations. So, and I'm not saying you would, Diane, I'm not saying PAR would do it, but Operation PAR could authorize it and it could be a contract with them and then they could have somebody else doing it and it could be at any, it, it could be out of a house, it could be out of a storefront, it could be out of any place. Originally, there was thought that, that in what I advocated for in the legislature was, you know, how is it in the Departments of Health? And, and the legislature at the end um, really wanted to keep it out of the governmental entities, and that's why they put the provision as a last-minute ad that no government funding for this. So, I mean, that's the only way it passed, frankly, uh, with that. But that concern about where, um, and, and, you know, you, you talk about the Not In My Backyard group, um, if we're not careful with this, this really has the potential to be a uh, very significant impact. You're going to have a lot of upset people. So, I, again, just, just from the background that I know in dealing with this for a few years. Thank you, Sheriff. And I, I agree. I support the concept, but I think it has to be very carefully crafted so we don't get unintended consequences. Thank, Thank you, you, Sheriff. Thank you, Sheriff. Uh, Commissioner Peters? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I agree with the sheriff 100 percent. I mean, Miami-Dade is a very different animal than Pinellas County. They have a designated funding source. They have a very robust uh, substance abuse program and mental health program. They have a designated funding source to help fund their, um, their, their mental health and addiction systems. Um, and they have receiving facilities. And if you look at the statute that was and, uh, and we passed the Miami-Dade pilot when I was in the legislature and worked on this for several years. Um, and so it's very specific. I have the bill up. I know I'm sure you guys don't because we didn't write in the ordinance exactly what it says in the, in the statute. And I, and I think it's almost just for clarity for anyone that wants to read it. I don't see why we wouldn't include some of that. But it does say it must be contracted with a licensed hospital 
or a healthcare clinic licensed under Part X of Chapter 400. It must, or, or a medical school, um, or a licensed addiction re receiving facility as defined in uh, statute um, 397. And so um, I, I'm not sure, or, or I'm sorry, I forgot one, a 501c3 HIV AIDS service organization. So it, it has to be a contract with one of those five. Um, and, and I agree with the sheriff on the bricks and mortar. I, I don't think it should be mobile. We still, I, I know I'm very familiar with what happened down in Miami. I don't want that to happen here. I agree with the kits and I more than, I, I mean, 100% enthusiastically believe that counseling um, and some kind of intervention program should be part of it because if you don't have that education or, or intervention program, then this doesn't prevent drug abuse. It doesn't prevent it at all. It's not gonna slow down the deaths for overdose. We already know we're on path for <laughs> significantly more deaths this year than last year. And there were 100 deaths last year from the year before. So we're on a horrific trend on deaths for people that are dying from overdose, uh, many of them using needles. Um, and they're not dying because of the reused needle mostly, they're, 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 they're dying from the overdose. And so if we don't have a robust substance abuse system for prevention, that's really the best way to stop the HIV and the others is having a robust prevention system for substance abuse. Um, and, and so this would then be an intervention. And unless there's some kind of intervention, some kind of robust intervention, we're not gonna stop the deaths of these overdoses. It's just, I, I, I don't believe that that's possible. So I, my recommendation is that we kind of go back to the drawing board on this and, and whether it's a task force or whatever, but I think the sheriff, if he can't be involved, that we take his recommendations and include them because I think those recommendations would protect the public uh, on, a, on a much greater level. Uh, Commissioner Long. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I do agree wholeheartedly with the recommendations from the sheriff and the comments that Commissioner Peters just made. And I, I am, um, I don't know that a medical school is exactly the type of provider that would be able to give all the wraparound services that we're looking for. So I would like to suggest that perhaps maybe we do, as Commissioner Welch suggested, have a workshop. It doesn't have to go on all day long, but ask the sheriff to come forward with recommendations that capsulize everything he just spoke about and then maybe we can go from there. It sounds like a really good starting place to me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, you, you also have Commissioner Seal and I think Commissioner Justice. I was just gonna to get to her, Commissioner Seal. Thank you. Um, thanks to the rest of the county commissioners already for the comments and to the sheriff. I agree with everything that's been said. The location in the NIMBY was already a concern of mine because um, if brick and mortar location, where would it be and how would it be kept away from residential areas? Um, also, if you could, I don't have the presentation in my agenda. So if you could email that to us, that would be helpful. Um, you mentioned other counties having the ordinance, but um, is it really just Miami-Dade and Palm Beach that have the program in play and right now? So that's one question. The next question is how much does it cost? And the third question is what sources of revenue have they found since it has to come from grants and donations from private resources? Thank you. So Miami-Dade is the only one that's actually doing the program. Um, Palm Beach has not started it yet. Um, I'm looking for the amount. Um, I did speak with Dr. Tukes about the program itself. What they did mention is that they have somebody who does grant writing 100% of their job. So, you know, besides uh, the University of Miami being a private entity, and writing grants, you know, to like the Elton John Foundation and some other foundations, that's how it's funded. I'll get the uh, amount that the Miami program is is using for operational costs. But like the sheriff said, they use a mobile van and actually have, they have more than one van now. So that would increase the costs and instead of just having a bricks and mortar uh, seated position who uh, does this program. And again, the, the funding that they have, they have to have private funding to, in order to actually buy the needles because no funding can be used for that. 
and I'll add, <clears throat> if, if you don't get the funding, it's going to be directly proportional on how uh, robust the program will be, right? Will it have counselors? Will it have people on site? So I, I think it really depends on what the model that is established, what, what's brought it to, to the county during the procurement process. And, uh, and obviously, one of the biggest challenges is because governmental funds can't be used is finding that source to, to, to fund that, uh, the model that they do propose. Commissioner of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, uh, and Barry, maybe correct me, but I kind of took this as the, the framework and that a lot of these details that have been brought up were going to be brought back in the contract. Um, one, is that correct? Well, I think that was the general concept, Dr. Cho, you're bringing forward. You can sort of speak to that. Um, they wanted to introduce it. This actually got kind of put on hold um, for a while back with everything going on. Um, but they, I think they wanted to introduce it. Um, but, you know, this sounds like there's a lot of details. I was I was actually surprised when I talked to the sheriff late last week uh, regarding some of these. And I think that some of the communication um, uh, did get lost. So I think, you know, the op there's an opportunity to step back. Whether they were going to address it in the ordinance or whether they should address it through the contract, uh, I think the sheriff wants to see, you know, some of that stuff in the ordinance to set the parameters of the program. I don't think there's any um, concern from staff with doing that. Um, so they, they can certainly take another crack at this before they get it back. Yeah, it, it sounds like that's where the consensus is that uh, uh, some of these parameters want to be tightened up in the ordinance rather than just in the contract is what it yeah. sounds like to me. So thank you, sir. I would agree. Okay. Um, <clears throat> any other questions from the commissioners? I, I hope I'm not missing anybody. Uh, yeah, Barry, I kind of agree that, you know, maybe we need to see this back in a uh, in a workshop form and maybe address each of these items that the sheriff's brought up and or any other items that the staff may have that they would like to deal with it. So I think that would be a, a great first step. I don't want to let's not push it out, though. Let's let's no. try to. Yeah, we'll, we'll get we'll get staff to, to have a, I mean, a, a meeting with the sheriff and, um, you know, and Dr. Cho and the whole team. Uh, re put put all the items on the table. See what they you know what they can come up in terms of ordinance and process uh, with getting to the final you know end product and where each uh, item belongs. So let us let us take a shot at that. We'll put it back on, to update you and uh, and and uh, have any any more discussion regarding the structure of this before we move forward. But that shouldn't take long to do. Okay. Um. Uh, is Lourdes, is, Lourdes is with us. I think she got back um, she has, yesterday. Uh, Lourdes, yeah. uh, you're out there. Uh, any any comments from uh, staff? Uh, no, just, you know, we met with the county attorney's office um, several months ago. You know, this has been a work We can't hear you, Lourdes. Hey, Lourdes. Can you hear us? Yeah, yes, yeah, we can. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Um, you know, and, and we've been working with the county attorney's office for several months. Um, you know, we've been working with the county attorney's office for so we had met with the county attorney staff had met with the county attorney's office several months ago, um, and it was recommended some of the um, items be removed. Hey, Lourdes, Lourdes, I'm sorry, you're fading in and out, and I I know some people are having a hard time hearing. I don't know what the issue is. Um, sorry. So. I'm I'm sending tech support up there, Commissioner. <clears throat> okay. Well, Lourdes, I mean, um, obviously, uh, and Daisy's on the line too, but Lourdes just got back last um, night, so. Uh, I was talking to her on the phone, and um, again, she was going to propose some amendments to the ordinance. Um, you know, she was just texting me, and she was going to offer some amendments to the ordinance. But you know, there's no sense in doing that. Let's make sure we have it right. Um, so let you know, staff sit down and go through this, and make sure that there's no detail, you know, left out. And I think that's a, a more thoughtful approach. I certainly don't want to do something that you know we then have to come back and modify later. Yeah. I, I agree, and I think just wanting to hear from Lourdes and Daisy, who seem to work most closely with it, would be appropriate. But yeah, you know, are you any better off there now, Lourdes or Daisy? Maybe you can uh, weigh in. I'm in my office. I'm not sure why you can't hear me, so I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Daisy, are you there? Uh, Daisy, if you'd go ahead and raise your hand. Uh, I know you're listening in, but I don't see you on the list here. Okay, hold on one sec, Commissioner. I'll get Daisy on. Mr. Chairman, while she's coming on, can I just add one thing? Sure, go ahead, Sheriff. Just, just quickly, I talked to Don Kroll about this, so just so you all are aware, is, is that, and I believe he can speak for himself, but the consensus is, is that what's in the statute is the floor, not the ceiling. 
there's nothing prohibits you from being uh, more restrictive than what is in the statute. So if you want to uh, put certain provisions like where it can't be and you want to exclude certain things, you can do that. And I think that's just important for everybody to know as we move forward with this is, is that you're not limited by what's in the statute as far as how you, how you can uh, pass the ordinance. And Thank you, Sheriff. And hopefully I'm back now. Can you hear me? No, no better. Sorry. Walk down here, Lourdes. <laughs> you have my seat. Daisy's on now. Uh, Commissioner Seal, while we're waiting. Uh, yes, I just wanted to, I updated my agenda and I did find the presentation. So um, thank you. I didn't want you to um, email it again. So is she there? Daisy's on the line and I'm gonna give up my seat for Lourdes. Okay. Okay. Hi, Hello, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me better. Yeah, welcome um, back. Thank you for that. Really, what I wanted to say, this is really just the beginning. Um, Dr. Cho and I were just talking about this, uh, you know, as late as yesterday. This is really just the beginning. There has to be a team put together to work out, you know, all of the details. It's really just to get the board's approval to move forward and have some of those conversations. And exactly what the sheriff said as far as tightening up and adding... Um, you know, that we don't want mobile, that we want counseling, um, that we want to make sure these test kits are where we want, is something we can put in the statute. Uh, it was removed several months ago in the ordinance, I'm sorry. It was removed several months ago um, after meeting with the county attorney's office, but we can add that all back. It's not an issue. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a good idea. Do you, um, uh, Don, do you do we need any kind of motion just to give consent a consensus to move forward with the uh, with the work uh, for for staffing and for a workshop? No, sir. I believe that the direction of the board, uh, the consensus that we've heard discussed, is pretty clear. Uh, so okay. follow Barry's direction to work towards a, a, a either workshop or at least a revised ordinance based on a working group of of uh, staff uh, involving the sheriff and DOH. Um, yeah, the the um, Ordinance can certainly be, I agree with the sheriff's assessment that we can be more limiting in the way this gets opened up through the ordinance and we can certainly take the, the direction on the policy decisions to do that and happy okay. to do that. Okay, that's great. And I, I guess I'm seeing a nodding of heads from all the commissioners. That's the kind of the direction. Yep. Nodding. Yes. Is that a so, nodding, uh, Commissioner Justice? <laughs> okay. All right, so that's uh, any any parting comments, Barry, or do you want to move on? No, I'm, we're good. We'll bring it back when um, after the team gets together and uh, have another discussion. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you, commissioners, for that conversation. All right, we're going to move on to citizens to be heard, and the public comments at this point are for any item that's not on the agenda. Remember, that's any item not on the agenda. We did um, we did advertise a, a, a hybrid meeting. Uh, all the commissioners are working virtually, but we do have uh, folks at the Magnolia Room to take any public comments there. So um, I guess, Brian, I'll turn it over to you for the public uh, uh, comment. Excuse me, I wanted to speak Thank on this you, bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And if it's okay, I'd like to start in the Magnolia Room. And uh, I know we have at least two speakers in there that would like to speak on, on Citizens Be Heard. So uh, go ahead and start uh, whoever's over there at the Magnolia Room. Give us your name, first name, last name, spelling, and address, please. My name is Greg Pound. I want to speak and, on the... Uh, you'll, we'll need to unmute uh, the Zoom meeting in the Magnolia Room, please, Communications Department. Are you there? Yeah. Yes, Can, sir. Go ahead. Okay, I want to speak on the opiate problem. I filled out a card for that, and I filled out one for assistance to be heard. I want to speak on both issues. Go ahead. Okay. The problem with the opiate situation we have in this country is not one thing that i admire about our politicians is you guys deal with the surface problems and not the root problem and that's and and the problem is two things the bible shows you the two things and i i i, I don't know when you guys are going to wake up we got drug stores on every corner we got a major problem i'm down at at the pier 60 this weekend the ambulance dragging people off the street overdoses one right after the other and I'm sitting here watching this. Now, this is, this is down on Pier 60 in the daytime. 
Okay, so the problem is the Bible shows there's two things. One is the destruction of the family, and the other one is sex outside of marriage. And you can laugh at that if you want. If we as a nation and a country don't correct these things, and it doesn't start here in Pinellas County, forget the rest of America. We better fix Pinellas County. And you guys, if you don't see what's happening, I mean, you're the leaders. You're, you're, some of you guys I don't respect as leaders because you're there illegally. You, the only thing that you've got that's representing God is that sheriff. Behind Robert Guattieri, there's a star, and it's called the Star of David. And that's what the sheriff's department is supposed to represent is the rule of law, and he doesn't. Okay, and so we have a major problem in this county, drug stores in every corner. Um, Trump says he's bringing all the pharmaceutical drugs out of China. All our drugs are made in China, a communist country that hates America, pumping all, all our pharmaceutical drugs, and they're pumping money into this country to destroy it and to destroy our young people. And it's coming through the doctors, giving all these prescriptions. Why aren't the doctors arrested? Why isn't the medical staff being held accountable for distributing drugs from China that's killing our young people by the thousands? Okay, and then the courts and the sheriff's department getting rich off the people. And I mean, I, you people should be crying. Literally, I can bring young people in here. Instead of passing out these um, treatment kits, you need to be passing out Bibles. And that's what you need to do. The only solution is a higher power. We say there's no high like the most high. And this country is being destroyed. And it's getting worse and worse. And it's, it's going downhill. We're in a big graveyard now. Money isn't, our money is going to be worthless. Look at the price of gold. Your dollar is going down. They destroyed the dollar. We're finished as a nation. That's the only thing this country has is the universal dollar, the oil, the petrodollar. We spend more money on drugs than petroleum. More money in gas and oil and plastic is spent on drugs in this country. So that's what I wanted to say about that. The other thing, systems to be heard, is we have now this destruction of the family. I have a daughter that the sheriff's department, who Robert Guattieri, we brought the issue up. She has a drug problem. She's been in the hospital for overdoses. Who's paying for all this stuff? Who's paying for all my kids' treatment after taking my children illegal from me, filing false reports, Megan Gallagher? And then we have Jim Coates' lawyer of nine years, now as our sheriff. You guys are breaking the law. You're the predators preying on the people. And when the people see it, the only people who need protection from law enforcement are white people. They're the only ones. No one else in this country needs them because they're the ones committing the crime. They're the ones that's running everything in the ground. And until this changes, until, until the people wake up, repent, and straighten this thing out, because it's going to get worse. It's going to come right to your house, and you people are going to be faced with it, and you're not going to get away from it. The creator says he's not going to be mocked by man for whatever, whatever man reaps. That's, that's also what he's going to, whatever he sows, that's what he's going to reap. He's not going to get away from it. Okay. Our legislature's tried to fix this for 15 years. Our legislature. All right. All right. Hold on. That's enough. We've given you an extra minute. Let's Thank you. Move on. Okay. Thank you. Ryan? I think we have another speaker from the Magnolia Room, okay. Mr. Chair. Hi, good morning, commissioners. Uh, David Ballard Geddes, Jr. I live on Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. Um, in relation to uh, this uh, heroin uh, issue, um, following the attack on the USS Cole, um, our, our forces went into Afghanistan um, at that point in time, I saw the deployment of Oxycontin to fill up the, the heroin market, which was drying up at that particular point in time. Um, now it seems as though, in my feelings, that the Monsanto Corporation has had time to establish its heroin product in Afghanistan, that the heroin is coming back. And they're trying to devise ways of maybe possibly like the marijuana market, making it a medical heroin dispensary product. And I feel as though this issue of handing out needles might be the leading uh, edge to that uh, bringing back the uh, heroin and trying to use some sort of political misogyny, if you will, um, to instate uh, um, this type of a uh, um, uh, you know medical uh, heroin dispensary. Um, thank you. Thank you, David. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, if there are no other speakers in the at the Magnolia Room, we'll go ahead to our virtual uh, participants. Uh, so if, at this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to speak on citizens to be heard, go ahead and raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting or hit star nine on the telephone. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we do have two speakers that wish to be heard. Our first speaker is Joseph Saunders. Mr. Saunders, if you'll go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your first, last name, spelling, and address, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Thank you very much. Um, uh, my name is Joseph H. Saunders. I live at 4916 62nd Avenue South in St. Petersburg. I've been a resident of Pinellas County for 39 years, and I'm here to speak in favor of the ordinance. I think it's great work that you folks are doing. Uh, I'm also have been the chairman of Operation PAR for over 10 years. Um, my brother died of a heroin overdose about 20 years ago. So I've been involved and interested in this area for a long time. Uh, I also was an assistant Pinellas County attorney from 1981 till 87 and was involved in setting up the Sunstar system. And um, so I think our county really has a history of leading the country in providing comprehensive health care. And um, uh, I think this is an essential tool, this ordinance, to provide comprehensive drug treatment program within Pinellas County. Um, on the board of directors of Operation PAR, we've discussed this issue, the pros and cons over a number of years. And we have a board with, with differing political viewpoints and different viewpoints on how to address addiction. But, but all the board members uh, um, have had experience with family members in, uh, in addiction. And so uh, I think the consensus really is, I can't speak for everyone on the board, but that we really discussed this and the science really supports this as one of the um, ways that's essential for a comprehensive plan to try to prevent drug addiction, prevent uh, HIV, and to reach out to uh, the addiction community to connect them with treatment and counseling. And so for those reasons, I, I support the work you're doing. And I'm speaking here in favor of this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, your leadership, and your involvement over the years. Um, Brian. Mr. Chairman, we have two other hands that are up. Our next speaker is Mr. David Waddell. Uh, Mr. Waddell, welcome back. If you go ahead and give us your first last name, spelling address for the clerk, and then uh, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Yes, good morning, everybody, honorable chair, the entire board and staff. Um, boy, it's been a tough uh, couple of months here. And uh, as I've said before, I wouldn't want to be sitting in any of your seats. I, uh, I commend you for your fortitude. Um, I just hope uh, the county overall, and I'm just touching on this in a general um, manner here. Uh, I want to speak later, of course, but uh, hats off to you. And since we're kind of starting to talk about other stuff, um, hey, let's talk about, well, we've got probably one of the best pieces of land in the country. And uh, we have a lot of flooding here in our neighborhood. Uh, <clears throat> currently, the county has an adjacent parcel, and I'm sure at least Mr. Welsh and uh, uh, Ms. Seal, um, both remember the Bayside Reserves project. That land now at one time was valued at 1.2 million. We can pick it up today for 600,000. Um, I did talk to Paul Kazi recently, and um, I understand that the evaluation and all the work that staff has put into this, uh, we ranked very high. Uh, <clears throat> as far as flood mitigation, it's critical to our neighborhood um, matter of fact, during Irma, without that tree line out back here, I think our whole neighborhood would have been wiped out. Uh, my neighbor uh, clocked 90 mile an hour winds back here. We had 11 trees down in the neighborhood. Thank God no one got hurt. No infrastructure was uh, damaged. But um, I'd like to get an update as to where we are on that. Uh, it was about a year ago. The county wanted to set aside 250 acres of environmentally sensitive lands. And uh, heck, if there's a, a change in topic where we can talk about something besides this gold darn virus, um, I know 
you guys, your staff is really um, doing a great job, and, and so are you. Um, but if you can find some time to uh, update our community, uh, we've got 700 people here at uh, the Pinellas Groves Hamlet Citizens Committee, of which I am the president. And um, we've had these discussions. I know uh, Karen and Ken both know this goes back oh, well over 13 years. And um, it's an opportunity to set aside 22 acres. And I know there's not going to be any money to work with. Um, all we can hope is that maybe we can work with the bank or uh, some of these other societies that try and set aside lands. Um, because if we miss this opportunity, you know, this is one of the only areas left in the county where you've got 22 combined acres on waterfront in old Tampa Bay. And my God, it is just beautiful. You know, we've hey, got Dave. the invasives, but we, we could get past that eventually. Hey, Dave. I think he just gave me the three minutes. You're up. Your time's up now, but we'll get back to you in a little bit on the on any other issue you might have to deal with. Okay. Uh, well, th thank you so much, Chairman Eggers. I appreciate your help, sir. Thank you. Anybody else, Brian? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, we have one more uh, speaker that wishes to be heard, and I'm probably going to butcher the name. We have Glenda Militano. Uh, Glenda, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself, give us your first last name, spelling, and address for the record, and you'll have three minutes to address the board. My name is Glenda Militano, and I live in Gulfport, and I'm a high school teacher here at Boca Ciega High School. And um, I know we've had a lot of issues about the school system. I know you guys have been talking about other issues, but um, I have health issues, and I was told that I had to do brick-and-mortar school. Um, I've been told today they're going to try to work with me, but this is a real issue with you know, I want to teach the kids in person. I want them to come back to school, but it is not safe. Most schools are not a safe environment for our students to be in. And the, the quarters are too close. The kids won't wear masks. I'm sorry, but they just won't. And to try to get them to not socialize is just impossible. Um, HR was not very much help when I called them, she basically told me schools are a business, which it is not, it is a service. And, um, you know, I feel bad for the administration. I feel like they're trying their hardest to work things out, but, you know, making us go back to school in a regular way at this point with Pinellas County having a high rate of um, the virus is just not, a possible solution. It's just not a very good solution. And I would really, really like for you guys to think about this and, you know, do some soul searching because you're going to bring kids in and, and parents and teachers into a situation where we're going to spread the virus more. And I would, it, it's just, it's sad. It's a very sad situation and it's upsetting. So, um, I would like for um, the board to really think about this before school starts on the 24th. I know we have to go back on the 13th and I don't even really know what's gonna happen because of my health issue. I've had cancer and um, other health issues and I just don't feel comfortable being in the school around 17, eight, you know, I have a hundred kids that I'm gonna be talking, be in front of every single week um, in close quarters. So it's it's not just about me, it's about everyone. You know, I, I just don't want anyone to get this virus. So um, that's all I have to say about this matter. Uh, Ma'am, just uh, thank you for your call and we welcome anybody to, to, to talk to us about any issue in the county. And I know this one's obviously very near and dear to you. I just wanted to make sure that you were aware that the Pinellas County School Board is the one responsible for all of the issues that you're talking about. You're talking to the Pinellas County Commission, which is a different board. So I just wanna make sure that you were, you're welcome to call here and, and express your feelings, but just wanna make sure that you're talking to the right board to address the concerns you have. Thank you, ma'am. 
Mr. Chairman, we did have two other hands that go up, that went up uh, in the time that that person was talking. Uh, our next speaker is Don, and I do not have a last name, so Don, if you go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your first last name, spelling, and address, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Okay, I actually have a question because this is really confusing on how you guys are doing the public comment because it keeps changing every week. Is there going to be a separate time for public comment on the emergency order, or is this the time slot? Yeah, Don, I'm sorry about that. Um, I'm, I'm substituting, so I probably have a little different approach to it, so I apologize for that. Yeah, I said in the beginning of the meeting that we'll have the regular kind of discussion on pandemic and anything related to that item coming up um, under item seven, no, let's see, hold 20. on. Item 20, local state of emergency, and that should be coming up in just a little bit. Okay, so I'm gonna wait then, is that okay? Yes, no problem, thanks, Don. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we do have one remaining speaker. Our next speaker is April Lott. Uh, Ms. Lott, if you'll go ahead and unmute yourself, give us your first, last name, spelling, and address, and you'll have three minutes to address the board. Hi, my Welcome. name is April. Hi, good morning. Uh, April Lott, President and CEO at Directions for Living, located at 1437 South Belcher Road, Clearwater, Florida. Uh, I'm just, I just really want to speak in favor of the needle exchange. I don't know if I've missed my opportunity to say that. Uh, I appreciate and uh, agree with the vast majority of what uh, Sheriff Gaultieri had to say in, in reference to some, some tweaks and modifications, but uh, I think that we absolutely have to move in this direction um, for all the reasons that have, been, that have been outlined, but I just wanted to make sure that I spoke in favor. Thank you, April. Yeah, we're going to be bringing um, staff's input from all the different folks that maybe spoke this morning at, to a workshop to deal with this in a workshop setting first before we bring it back for a vote by the commission. Perfect. Okay, thank you, April. Uh, Mr. Chairman, there are no other citizens that wish to be heard. Okay, thank you, Brian. Appreciate that. Okay, we're going to move on to the, um, uh, uh, let's see, hold on a minute. Just see. Okay. We have a number of items on the consent agenda, probably 16 items, um, other than item six, which I'd like to uh, uh, separate out. Uh, is there anybody else that would like to bring any other items, uh, take any other items out of the consent for discussion? You have Commissioner Seal with her hand up, Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, Commissioner Seal. Uh, yes, agenda item 12 and 15, please. Just some questions. Okay. Anybody else? Move the balance, Mr. Chairman. Second. Okay, um, Brian, we have a motion and a second. Uh, can you check with the uh, public? See if sure. If there, at this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on the consent agenda, please raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting or hit star nine on the telephone. And Mr. Chair, it doesn't appear that there's anybody that wants to speak on the consent agenda. Okay, th uh, thank you. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay, we'll come back to the three items now. <clears throat> uh, item six, which is a division of Inspector General, a follow-up audit on the Pinellas Public Library Cooperative Operations and Internal Controls. They did a original audit um, and they followed up with a second audit. Still some work to be done. And um, <clears throat> I just had some concerns and some questions and uh, Brian uh, Lowak, who sits on the board, was going to bring some of those comments forward. However, Cheryl Morales, who is the executive director of the Pinellas Public Library Cooperative, is with us this morning. And uh, I know that they are working hard to make some changes, but I'll let, I won't put words in her mouth. I'll let Cheryl speak a little bit on, uh, on what's going on uh, at the uh, cooperative from her perspective. Cheryl? Cheryl, you have to go and unmute, unmute yourself on Zoom. <clears throat> Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Commissioner Edgars, those were the perfect words to put in my mouth, so thank you for that. And, and thank you for inviting me to join you today. Yes, the board and I have been working very hard uh, since the board took over the PPLC organization in a, in a 2013 reorganization. Every single policy has had to be re rewritten. And um, we uh, also accomplished a new interlocal agreement, a new strategic plan for the organization. So while we are continually working on the um, correcting the findings in the audit, we're not 
fully there yet. So talk to me about just briefly, if you could, about your staff um, or you, your staff, whoever is involved with the board and uh, how do you address these issues and how are you address in implementing uh, the discussions and the changes? Just so that I uh, it just saw it seemed like an awful lot that were uh, OK, have been implemented, but a lot of partially and some that were not implemented at all. So just want to make sure that how you all are addressing or stacking up the priorities in your mind. Thank you. Um, so uh, I just want to take a second to review um, that list so that I can go through them one at a time with you. Um, so the non-implemented ones, um, the big one is the, the, like the changes to the bylaws and the changes to the um, Articles of incorporation that I'm working with the board chair on revising those things. There's also an, another revision to the interlocal agreement on the grants um, part of it because the board decided that they didn't want to get involved with approving grants. Um, so that's a change to the interlocal agreement, which is uh, not up for a couple of years. Um, for re revision. Um, and then the partially implemented ones are things that just take a very long time. Um, and, and all of these, uh, all of the findings are things that we agree with. And some of the findings are things that we brought to the attention of the auditors so that we could get their opinions on. And so they were included in the audit report uh, from that perspective. So we are in agreement and we have prioritized. And like you said, we have gotten a lot of uh, things accomplished and everything else is in the works. Okay, well, <clears throat> that's, that's fine. And, I, and, and maybe from time to time, um, you can come back to us and give us an idea what's going on in terms of the, uh, the rest of the implementation so we don't have to wait for the follow-up to the follow-up audit, okay? Okay, um, that sounds great. We'll have, be happy the, uh, to do that. Other, Questions from the commissioners uh, for Cheryl? Okay, Cheryl, I appreciate you being here this morning and look forward to continuing to hear on the uh, your update or your progress uh, on these recommendations. Thanks, Cheryl. Fabulous. Thank you also. Have a great right. day. Okay, um, we'll go on to item 12. We'll come back for maybe we'll capture all three of them in an approval. Uh, item 12, uh, Commissioner Seal. Uh, yes, I'll ask my questions for both item 12 and 15. 12 would be, since it still will be going out to our um, social service providers and other entities for the surplus equipment, I would be curious as to who may access that. So if we could just have a brief report on um, any successes there, um, that would be great. And then on agenda item 15, um, for the replace, we have a budget for the replace for the architectural, but I'm curious what the overall budget is for um, these new buildings. So those are my who. Okay. So we have both Andrew Pumpkins on the line, so he can certainly answer any questions regarding the way in which they the surplus equipment and uh, advance notice that they've been out for the nonprofits and how successful that's been. And Megan Ross is on that can answer questions regarding the overall project. All right. Thank you. Um, go ahead. Andrew, you'll need to uh, share your video and audio if you're going to speak to the commission. Good morning, Commissioner Andrew Pupke, Division Director for Facilities and Real Property. Commissioner Seal, I believe I heard the second part of, of your question, but uh, if the question is, can we provide a report on the successes of uh, the contacts that we have with the community organizations after the auction, we can certainly provide that information to you. you know, I think she was asking how successful we've been in getting <laughs> and working with them. So they, because uh, we give them advance notice of items. So how successful has that program been uh, with helping them with uh, purchasing some of our uh, using um, surplus equipment? Thank you Actually, for that. Actually, the thing there, we're donating any surplus equipment, correct? We're donating 
surplus equipment before we go to auction. That and is I just, true. Yes. I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. And I just wonder how successful we are. Are we distributing items to other not-for-profits? Yes, I would say the success has been um, average, limited, uh, perhaps. Um, it's based upon the information that we put out, which we do after each approval of a, an auction by the board. We have a standard communication that we reach out to the nonprofits, uh, those that have uh, been designated by the board, as well as the social action funding uh, entities. And we do have responses from them, and we do donate those items to them that uh, they are desirous of before we reach the point that we're ready to start selling those items uh, through our, our auctioneer. So over the, the time that I've been involved, I would say it's it's been average. Um, it's dependent upon the items that are up for surplus at that time, uh, if they have need for them. Uh, hopefully that is an answer to your question. We could certainly, uh, to my earlier point, follow up with you if that's a desire of you or the board to uh, provide a report on who is accessing those each auction. Commissioner Seal. I don't want, I hopefully I don't want you all to do this each time, maybe just an annual report or something or twice a year, just knowing if we, you know, who is accessing the, the surplus equipment and um, it's, it's just more out of curiosity than anything because some of these items um, could add value to our community. And I just want to make sure people are, um, or the not-for-profits are utilizing them. Thank you. Okay. So you Andrew, Andrew, get, Andrew will get a yeah, report together to show you the success and how many people have taken advantage of that. Hey, yeah, Andrew, if you could just also just give us a list of who you reach out to in, on a standard basis, that would be great. And then maybe the commissioners may have suggestions for some other people that you can include on that list. Thank you. Certainly. Yes, sir. Thank you. Item 15, Barry. Megan. <laughs> Hi, uh, good morning, commissioners. And uh, Commissioner Sale, to answer your question, yes, the construction costs for this facility are looking to be approximately $6 million. It is programmed in the budget for fiscal year 22 and 23. Um, and additionally, we're looking at submitting uh, for the construction costs as part of a countywide grants application for the community development uh, block grants, the mitigation funding, and we're working through Hank Hod on that countywide submittal along with other departments. And I believe um, the intent to apply um, for all of those projects are gonna be coming before you in September at a future board meeting. Thanks. Commissioner Seal. She gave the thumbs up, Commissioner Eggers. Oh, I, I think she, she's good to go. <laughs> yeah, I can't I can't see her. The Magnolia room has displaced her on my screen, so it'd be great to have her back. But um, OK, so we have item six. Um, we have item six, which was the uh, the Division of Inspector General report on the PPLC. Uh, item 12, declaration of surplus and authorized sale or donation of miscellaneous county owned equipment. And item 15, which is the ranking of firms in agreement with Mason Blah and Associates for architectural services. Can I have a motion to accept those three or? So moved. Mr. Welch. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Seal. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay, I get that's it for the agenda we're moving on to the regular agenda and the first item on the list is a local state of emergency and Barry I'll turn it over to you uh, commissioners this would be extending the local state of emergency from August the 14th through August the 21st um, as you know we uh, are still actively working with all of our community partners um, sheriff's office health department um, and to combat this pandemic that's uh, taken over, you know, not just our community, but throughout the United States and the world. We have seen success here uh, locally, the mask, the combination of the mask, the combination of education, people practicing social distancing, limiting uh, the bars and, where, and large gatherings, 
has had an impact where uh, we we believe um, certainly dr. Cho can speak to this and from from his standpoint but you know as we reported this morning at a 4.9 percent positivity rate over the last seven days is a bit of good news something that we haven't um, we've been waiting for for a while um, the our and what he also reported this morning is our health care system has seen has been stable those are those are good signs but it's not over and, and we're going to be at this for a while what I wanted to take this portion of the report is to um, further announce the um, opening of the the testing site at Ruth Eckert Hall. Those are available in the mornings of Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, beginning at 7 a.m., 7 to 10, uh, I believe. And again, these uh, that, that allows uh, additional testing. Um, this is the same site. That's a, a combination of BayCare, uh, Ruth Eckert, City of Clearwater, the state of, um, of Florida, and, uh, and our, our own staff uh, to stand up that site. Uh, they do want a doctor's referral or um, um, symptoms to access that site. We still are working the Mahaffey Theater, uh, the Mahaffey Theater site. Uh, that is the county staff working in conjunction with St. Petersburg in the state. Um, but we're also knowing the, the other testing sites. So anybody that wants to see that type of information or testing sites can go to our website. It's on the front page of our, of our website to give you the hours of operation for the various uh, testing centers and all of all, all of our other dashboard information is available. Dr. Cho's on the line, Sheriff's on the line. They can certainly add anything to that, but we would ask that you uh, pass uh, this extension. Thank you, uh, thank you, Barry. Uh, Dr. Cho, uh, maybe you could talk just briefly about the, uh, the hospitals, um, the super sniffs and the sniffs, and you can define those again just for everybody uh, for a benefit and just talk a little bit on how interrelated they are as to capacity for taking care of our COVID patients and other health patients that we have in the county. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so a super sniff uh, stands for super uh, uh, skilled nursing facility. It's uh, really the, the given name is a dedicated COVID facility. It's having expertise to hold on to COVID patients from long-term care facilities. And they are inter, uh, intertwined with hospital capacities because uh, if they don't have these types of facilities or the standard long-term care facilities do not have these dedicated units, then the only other options are hospitals. And I know that was a bigger issue about a, about a month ago, um, but yeah, given the fact now we have uh, two dedicated sort of uh, super sniffs, uh, given the changes in some um, uh, discharge criteria from uh, um, ACA, we've seen great improvements in terms of the number of COVID patients within our hospitals. Um, and uh, to date, as of uh, at least yesterday, we had 266 COVID patients in hospital beds, which is a huge improvement than where we were about uh, even just a week ago. So we're really heading uh, in the right directions. Um, but as, um, and as uh, also to highlight what Barry mentioned, uh, our seven day rolling average percent positivity is, is um, at 4.9%. So one of the lowest we've seen in a long time. So I uh, just want us to keep up the good work and uh, continue with that social distancing and masks. Thank you, Dr. Cho. Uh, Dr. Jameson, if you're there, if you could maybe just uh, have any other comments as it relates to the hospitals and our, 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 our patients, our nurses, our, you know, the, the, the state nurses or whatever, just any comments you might have as it relates to the hospitals. Sure, thank you. Um, so in general, uh, I just would echo Dr. Cho's comments that uh, we're in a bit better situation than we were over the last few weeks. Um, our hospitals are uh, currently doing pretty well in terms of keeping up with the demand on them, uh, both from regular patients as well as from uh, COVID patients. Um, I would again echo what I mentioned earlier about um, uh, a concern regarding people being uh, reluctant to seek care uh, at this time. Uh, if you are having a medical issue, I just want to encourage everybody to please don't delay seeking care. Make sure that you get that care. We're beginning to see more and more evidence of people um, delaying care and having uh, worse outcomes uh, from around around the country as this goes on. And I want to make sure that, that our residents here in Pinellas uh, know that, that they can safely access care in our hospitals. Uh, Dr. Jameson, any updates on the epidemiology um, on the epidemiology front? Uh, I know that you had spoken to this a couple of weeks ago, just to let everybody know that the, 
The bad news was it probably isn't going to disappear, but the good news was that it'd probably be kind of a peaks and valley uh, progression of the disease. And just thought if you had any update on anything that might be that you're reading about or hearing about either Dr. Cho or Dr. Jameson. Sure. Um, I think uh, that analysis remains unchanged, that, that we do not expect to see sort of massive waves followed by almost no cases, but rather we're going to continue to see the fire burn uh, with occasional peaks and valleys. Um, I, I would echo what Dr. Cho said about uh, our case counts going down and overall our picture improving over the last few weeks. Um, but I would also say now is not the time to take our foot off the gas. Um, we are still significantly higher than we'd like to be, and we need to take this opportunity to really drive the disease down as much as possible in our community, um, particularly as we look forward to other events in the community, such as um, you know schools coming back together or, or other issues. I do want to make sure that, that we take advantage of where we are right now to continue the press to really knock this thing down as much as we can uh, so, that, so that we don't have as much impact from those future uh, events. Um, I, I do, again, still think that we're going to see this sort of with us burning for a while uh, and that we will likely see peaks and valleys along with that. And uh, I, I would also add that uh, something I mentioned this morning as well as last uh, week as well, we do have a vulnerable population here in Pinellas County. We will be disproportionately impacted as it pertains to death in terms of severe outcomes, including hospitalizations. Um, and um, our death rate, um, and they, they've been putting that on, a, on our daily reports, has cre crept up to 2.9%, which unfortunately is one of the higher ones in the state. So um, any increases can have the accompanying um, poor outcomes here in the, in the county and something we have to be mindful of in protecting our, our vulnerable population. Uh, Dr. Cho, just one comment, just if you will, on the um, long-term care facilities when we first started. Obviously, there, we found a lot of issues and problems in some of the uh, long-term care facilities. Our, a lot of work uh, in your group, our staff, uh, ACA, you know, a number of different organizations trying to get involved and, and trying to get our hands around that. Um, it's still an issue. Um, what, what are the major, would you say, what were the, the things that are most important that we need to really focus on? Because that seems to be the area that we're running at about 3% uh, as far as mortality versus 2% on the rest of the state. Anything in particular that we can be doing in partnership with our long-term care facilities that, that would even perhaps help that situation a little better? Uh, Commissioner Eggers, uh, yeah, you um, uh, did highlight that uh, we have made some um, a great improvement so over these last few months. And I think, again, we're blessed to have this um, uh, collaboration of community partners. Uh, we were one of the first uh, counties, for example, in the state of Florida to really leverage the fire departments. Uh, uh, these great uh, districts went out on their own to really help and uh, um, put all hands on deck, visited the sites, helped them out with PPEs, helped them out with uh, assessments, helped them out with fitting testing. Uh, fit testing um, in terms of uh, ACA has also uh, uh, participated in our task force, uh, making sure that they do have the testing availability. Um, and the state did implement the testing for all the staff every two weeks, and I think that's been going well, um, really serving as that sort of safety net. But really, I think a lot of it's just continuing to work with the same partners, emergency management, uh, EMS, uh, the fire departments, um, the county government, just and the hospitals have been a huge Godsend as well, just really working together to address this really um, vulnerable populations in our long-term care. Thank you, Dr. And Cho. If I could just add, if I could just yeah. add to that, that this is this is an issue for our population in Pinellas that we've seen before. We saw the same thing after Hurricane Irma, where we we really noticed that we do have a large number of folks out there with underlying conditions or uh, who are particularly elderly and vulnerable. Uh, for whatever reason. And so uh, the highlight I would just like to make about this is that we are all in this together. Uh, and this should be a call to the rest of the community to do whatever you can to protect those folks, knowing that we have a disproportionately high uh, percentage of those within our community. Uh, thanks, Dr. Jamison. Uh, any of the commissioners have any questions that they want to fire away at the folks? Yeah, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, one, just I, I wanted to uh, thank you and, and our doctors for highlighting that. The, uh, uh, one of the reasons I think we're having success is we do have a more senior population that is taking this seriously, uh, but that is also one of our high risks of 
a high senior population in our long-term care facility. So I appreciate you and the doctors highlighting that. And every time I share the data with folks, I always say the numbers are looking really good, but if you work with or live with uh, seniors or folks that have uh, are in higher risk categories, you have a special responsibility to take those even more seriously and take all those needed precautions. Um, the question I had was I read the article, and I think I shared it with some of you, that uh, we were getting some of the immediate test uh, equipment in some of our facilities, and I didn't know how far and widespread that was among our long-term uh, long care facilities, if you knew uh, how widespread, how, how available are those uh, immediate tests that we're getting. I, I can speak. I can speak to that. Um, I know at the federal level, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid uh, have been working directly even with some of the facilities. Um, I, I, I think you're referring to the article uh, highlighting Jacaranda getting uh, some uh, that testing. Uh, I can yes, tell you yes. that uh, outside of uh, Jacaranda, we do have another facility that has gotten the similar equipment. Um, uh, so um, the, the overall arching goal is to try to uh, provide a lot of the facilities to have those point of care sort of tests. Um, in terms of the time frame, in terms of if everyone's going to uh, receive it or are they going to prioritize some of the facilities, I, I don't have the answers at this time. Okay. Commissioner Welch? Yeah, you have to I, unmute I, I, up there. I, yeah, I'm playing Dave Eggers today, so I'm <laughs> unmuting. Thank you, Commissioner Welch. Um, just a few thank yous. You know, I think the trends and the data, you know, show the impact of the decisions we made in the community's response you know, to the mask and social distancing. This is only the second quarter, I get it, long way to go. But I think it, it shows if you listen to the data and the science and the community has buy-in that it, that it works. So I, I just want to thank everyone. Uh, Dr. Cho, I was surprised to hear excitement in your voice. You're usually so calm. But when you talked about the 4.9 seven day rolling uh, positivity rate this morning, I mean, that's a big deal. And um, appreciate you bringing that out. The other thing, I just wanted to thank um, the team for putting the um, the trend data for deaths up on our website. I went there this morning and I saw that, that you have that there on the Pinellas County site. And that really, you know, shows the picture of of the peaks and that we're actually decreasing in the, in the death um, in the county for now. So I just wanted to say some thank yous for that and, and uh, look forward to uh, the second half here, continuing the progress. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Welch. Uh, I can't see Commissioner Seal, but uh, anybody else have any questions or comments? Okay, um, Brian. Oh, did I hear somebody? No, Commissioner Eggers. I think you're good to go as far as questions. Okay, from go the, ahead. From the commission. Yeah, go ahead, Brian. Uh, as okay. far as the so at this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on the state of emergency, go ahead and raise your hand in the Zoom meeting or hit star nine on the telephone. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we do have two members of the public that wish to, sh wish to speak. Our first member is Don. Uh, Don, I'm sorry, I forget your last name. So if you go ahead and unmute, give us your first, last name, spelling, and address. Uh, yes, Don Bowler, B as in boy, O-H-L-E-R. Address is 6678 54th Avenue North, St. Petersburg. Uh, given our population of more than 974,996, our cumulative rate at 17,941 cases is only 1.8%. I figured the only possible way to get these high percentages would be to calculate the total number of positive results to the number total number of tests each week. It was stated last week that we had a 1% drop from the previous week, but based on the numbers given, 184 daily totaling 1,309, and using the highest number provided for the week prior, 230 daily totaling 1,610, had us, uh, <clears throat> had us as of last Thursday at an active 0.14%. The previous week only 0.17 percent and we actually had a 20 percent decrease in cases according to the pinellas county covid dashboard accumulatively we have had 2400 admitted in the er in the er 0.24 percent per population and 1723 admitted in the hospital 0.17 percent of population deaths at 502 is 0.05 percent per population 0.8% of our case total, giving our county a 7.3% overall survival rate and a 99% survival rate for those outside long-term care facilities. As a county, we only hold 3.4% of the state total. Since Thursday, we have had 582 additional cases, 
0.06% per population, averaging 116 per day, resulting in a 45% decrease over a five-day five time span from the last week. We are not, nor have we ever been, in a local state of emergency, and you can't claim the mass health as it is a mathematical impossibility to have actively exceeded a 1.8% positivity rate ever. It's time to rescind the mask ordinance, but above all, I think it is time for you to lay out to the citizens of Pinellas the distribution of the CARES Act funds, how much, to whom, and why, and please relay this to Mayor Kreisman, giving the threat over his jurisdiction to have businesses shut down with only 7,406 accumulative cases at 0.75% per population and 2.8% and per city population. Are you finished, Sean? I'm sorry. Do make yes, sure you're... I'm finished. Oh, okay, thank you, Don. Appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we do have two remaining speakers. Our next speaker is Dave Waddell. Uh, Mr. Waddell, welcome back. If you go ahead and unmute, and you'll have three minutes to address the commission. Good morning again, everybody. Um, David Waddell, 4835 164th Avenue North. Here's my situation as a senior. I'm 62, um, stage four cancer survivor, taking care of a friend of mine that's a cancer survivor. And um, neither one of us have been able to basically leave our house. My dog is sick. Um, he's been wandering around the neighborhood uh, because he feels like a caged animal. He's an ex-cop, curious guy. So I got to spend like 350, 400 and get a GPS locator and tracker for him. My dog is sick. Um, I have, uh, I'm afraid I was supposed to go in for ultrasounds, okay? My left leg has got blood clots in it. I've had diarrhea going on six weeks. Still haven't been able to get my test. I've given up on that. Um, my doctor, thank God, is out of the hospital and he's back home. So here's what we got. And I appreciate Dawn's uh, math calculations, but I did study statistical analysis back in my college and engineering days. And our methods are unsound. These numbers, hey, you know what? Unless we fact check them by a factor of at least five to 10, they are incorrect. I can guarantee you that because there is no standardized approach to this. The st statistics and the modeling are incorrect. But while we're at 4.9% per se, by the way, I was in theater, so we can make up whatever we want. But while we think it's down, let's act like it's down and prepare that it's gonna get five times to 10 times worse, okay? We're not getting the state and the feds to back us up. So once again, I've said we're on our own. Now, I'm wearing goggles. I just recently heard the NIH say that up to 20% can be passed in, inside a building through your eyes, okay? Um, I don't know what Dr. Cho has to say about that, but us seniors that are out here, um, we're held captive. Um, and, you know, I, I, I have driven around a little bit. I had to go to Walgreens, you know, of course, for our prescriptions. And I'm seeing gatherings at bus stops and, and I drive by some bars and they look pretty packed. And I haven't really started looking because I haven't been out of my house for 10 days. I just recently went out, that was, I think, Sunday. But, we can't rely upon anybody but ourselves. And that's what it comes down to. We need to amp this up, Dr. Cho, we're under 4.9%. We missed the window last time. Contact tracing is gonna be required and we gotta really do it in an automated fashion. Um, also, mandatory reporting anonymously. Now, Sheriff Bob, I don't know if you're grinning at me or heard a good joke, but you're doing a great job. All right. And I don't know what's going on in the bars because I don't go to bars anymore. I used to go visit friends occasionally. Like I said, I hadn't been out of my house in 10 days until Sunday. And I go every day at seven o'clock to give my friend his meds for today and then for tomorrow. And then I bring him over once or twice a week and I make dinner so he can get out and have some companionship with me and my sick dog 
because June 23rd is when I told you my story, and I don't think none of you read it except Karen, all right? And I, I don't know what I'm gonna do. So when you talk about mental health, the only reason I can move is because I have to take 50 oxycodone, five 10 milligram tablets a day, all right? Thank God I'm prior military and I can bone up, all right? But if hey, you David. guys don't do the right thing and it don't do it five times 10, we're in big trouble. Thank, Thank you, Dave. David. David, I'm giving you an extra minute and a half. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Yep. Mr. Chairman, we have one other speaker that wishes to be heard. Uh, this member from the public is on the phone line, last four digits, 4945. If you'll go ahead and unmute yourself, give us your first, last name, spelling, and address, and you'll have three minutes to address the board. Sure. My name is David Happy. Last name is spelled H-A-P-P-E. Address is 903 Cypress Cove Way in Tarpon Springs. Firstly, Dave Waddell, God bless you. Um, I hope that everything works out well for you. A couple points. Number one, Barry said that the masks were reducing COVID in Pinellas. I think that's an opinion, not a fact, but I'm receptive to any data that he can supply that would tell us what that fact is. Um, we are wondering, uh, Commissioner Welch said that the public has buy-in on what the council has done here, but I'm aware that there is a taxpayer funded lawsuit that's been filed against the commission and against the county for the mask ordinance. So I'm wondering if you can give us an update on that. Wondering what specific metrics you are waiting for to repeal your mask mandate. I'm asking for the exact criteria that you're looking for with all of the numbers. Uh, the Tampa Bay Times reported today that Pinellas' numbers are way down from last week. As the doctor stated on the call, um, Tampa Bay Times said that the positivity rates in Pinellas are now 3.5%. We're just wondering what it's gonna take for you guys to repeal the ordinance that you put in, let people go about their lives. Dr. Jameson said, we're all in this together. Dr. Jameson, here's a clue for you. We're not all in this together. While you're still drawing your salaries and maybe enjoying uh, the, the tail end of this epidemic, there are businesses and people that are hurting by the tens of millions. And we're waiting for a sign of hope. We're waiting for some positivity to come from this commission and this council. We're waiting for some truth in the way that you report the numbers, and we're looking for an exact metric that you're looking for in order to make the determination as to whether and when you are going to repeal the mask mandate. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Any, anybody else, Brian? Mr. Chairman, there are no, nobody else that wishes to speak on this item. Um, but certainly, Barry, um, we had just a, just a few today that, that called in and I do think that it, you know as we go down the road we have to keep understanding the sciences keep understanding the numbers trying to keep up with what the latest is from our uh, our, our doctors the epidemiology studies that are going on and, and just to have a continue to evolve and continue to educate and inform our public I will tell you that I know of no manufacturing of numbers going on whatever you see on our dashboard is accurate assessment of what's going on out there. So um, I don't think there's anybody doing anything untoward that uh, that might have been implied. And I don't, I'm not, I don't want to go too far with that and say that that's what you were implying. But I do think the truth is being said as we know it. And uh, we're doing our best to kind of put our arms around this thing so that what happened in J June, which was an exponential rise in cases, doesn't come back. That's why I asked the doctor at the beginning about how does he see this progressing, ups and downs, instead of you know, maybe running away uh, with exponential growth and then disappearing? It's going to be more up, kind of up and down. We got to manage it. We got to be careful with it. Uh, to the question about metrics and when we do when we do uh, things, I think it's a bunch of issues that we're looking at. A, a lot of information that we're trying to take in, and at the end of it, trying to make a, a gut feel on what we think is best for our residents and. Um, you know, I'm not saying that we, we, we have all the answers. I really think it starts with our residents taking it seriously. That's where it all begins. So anything we're doing is trying to augment and help. And 
and, and continue to educate as we get educated on this as well. So I'm, I'm very proud of the effort that's been going on. I heard all the statistics uh, that, were, that were given earlier, and I certainly appreciate that. Uh, and still we have people that are dying now, you know, again, there's no acceptable levels. So I'm going to keep uh, uh, leaning on the side of being overcautious, if you want to call it that. I'm not, I don't call it that, but if that's what you think we're being, then I think it's better to be that way until we know more about it. One of the things that Dr. Jamison keeps telling us is we still don't know as much about this disease or near as much about this disease as we know. And so, frankly, I don't know how it would affect me. I don't know how it would affect Commissioner Justice or Commissioner Long or Commissioner Gerard or any of us. So, I mean, in any one of you out there that's that, that's listening or watching or any resident. So, each one of you, it matters how we act and how how the information that we're pulling together. So, again, I know it's I know it's frustrating a little bit. Um, the positives are that we're learning how to deal with this, learning how to live with this, and and to me. That's the most important thing. And as we get that under our belt, I think that's where the that's where the solution will end up being. Um, and continued development of the sciences and the vaccines and the and the treatment of those who have it and that kind of thing. Commissioner, I I don't want to ramble too long. Commissioner Welch, I saw your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, I just I want to respond to a couple of comments, and I think you um, covered it well, Mr. Chairman. But just to the last speaker, I mean, we are seeing community buy-in. We're not seeing 100 percent. But walk into a Publix, walk into uh, a Wawa, walk, walk into a Home Depot, you're seeing very good compliance. And some of that is coming from the private sector, by the way, requiring that folks that come into these retail locations have masks on top of our ordinance. Um, but I think, as you said, this is going to be the new normal for a while. And our intent all along has not been to hurt businesses, it has been to make the adjustments we need to make to to lower the curve so we can keep businesses open. I mean, that's been our whole intent. So, you know, I disagree with the caller saying that we're impacting businesses. We're trying to keep businesses open. Uh, and finally, to, to, to the comment about a lawsuit, I'm only aware of one that, that was led by the state legislator from, I believe, Lake County. Um, is there another lawsuit, Don, that you know of? No, sir. The, the, um, one that you're talking about from uh, the representative from Howie in the Hills is the one that we had been served with. Our response is not due until August 18th. Uh, it is the same or similar to many other lawsuits throughout the state. Uh, and to the best of my knowledge, and every one I've seen so far where they've gone before a judge, they've been defeated. Uh, I believe they have appealed at least one of those, uh, but um, we continue to be taking a stance to defend that. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Barry, um, when do you um, plan on kind of giving us the, the latest on, on the CARES programs and where we are with each of them and how they're doing? And uh, we, I mean, we could do it today, but I mean, we're going to be meeting next week as well. Maybe you could give us an update on, on the business phase two and that kind of thing. So just a comp question. Item 31 under county administrator's report, you're going to get a full update. Okay. All right. I didn't see that in here. So, um, and then the other question, maybe we can talk about it then, Barry, just a, a, a note. I've gotten a couple of emails from folks that are outside of our county, but work with people inside of our county, um, talking about having CARES funds available for workforce training, um, AM skills, the, any of that effort that, to retrain. I'm not sure how they qualify, but apparently they do. So, um, maybe we could maybe we could talk about that as well. Um, if not today, yeah, just maybe maybe you could look into that and come back to we, us. Those will probably have to be specific questions. I mean, um, uh, certainly we've uh, part of the program that you pass has a training component. Uh, we're working on that. However, that'll be contracting with um, you know crew source you know to be able to execute on that program. Those types of individual we'll have to look those up, but. I'm yeah, sure I think it's, I, 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 maybe the connection, maybe the connection is with the number of people that have lost jobs, you know, and that uh, so that we can help those who are helping people. Right. So that this does, I guess it kind of fits into that same mode. So anyway, if we could just look into that to see if those organizations, in your opinion, our staff's opinion, they are, they are outside in other counties. If it's a, in your opinion that they could be used to augment some of those 
some additional funds for those uh, for those groups. Thank you. Um, anything else? Uh, we've heard from the public. Any other comments from the commissioners? I need a motion to move forward, uh, uh, continuing the local state of emergency. So move for second. Commissioner Justice and Commissioner Welch is a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Was that a, who was that last aye? Was that opposition or appro uh, approval? Can everybody raise their hand again, please, in, in favor of. I can't see Karen, so. Oh, Commissioner Steele has her video off, uh, Commissioner Eggers. Uh, she, I can see her. She raised her hand. Okay, thank you. Oh, there she that is. I'm sorry. <laughs> that, that motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right. Um, we'll can move on. I ask go, one go ahead. question? Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I'm Mr. sorry. Bell. I wrote yeah. it down. Dr. Cho, uh, on the schools, and I'm, we're not the school board, I'll say that for the record, but on the schools, is, are they still on track for August 24th, as, as you're aware? Uh, to my knowledge, yes. I understand that there is a workshop over there um, today. I'm not sure if that's already occurred, um, but they were meeting to discuss further. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. All right, uh, Barry, we'll move on to item 21 under human services, please. Item 21 is an, um, an addendum to the agreements with the Florida Department of Health um, and Operation PAR for the Healthcare for the Homeless Program. Uh, this provides additional funding uh, for these programs. Move approval. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second for this item. Are there any questions from? The commission. Okay, Brian, you want to check with the public? At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on agenda item 21, please raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting or hit star nine on the telephone. <laughs> and Mr. Chairman, we don't have anybody that wishes to comment on this item. Okay. Um, all right. Do we have, did, I'm sorry. Do we just have a motion? I, I, yeah, yes. Okay. Uh, all in favor say aye. Raise aye. your hand. Aye. Any any opposed? Okay, motion carries unanimously. We'll move on to item 22 under management and budget. This is a fiscal year 2020 board uh, budget amendment to realign appropriations from the general cost center to the sheriffs. This will cover um, COVID related un, um, unanticipated expenses within the sheriff's office. Move approval. Second. And a motion and a second. Any questions by the commissioners? All right, Brian, can you check with the public? At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on agenda item number 22, please hit star nine on the telephone or raise your hand virtually. And Mr. Chairman, there's no one that wishes to speak on agenda item 22. Okay, thank you. Um, all in favor of number 22, please raise your hand. Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Moving on to item 23 under public works, we have two items, Barry. This is a construction agreement. The first one is a construction agreement and an addendum between the county and the Florida Department of Transportation. This one stall uh, additional fiber optic cable and new and existing tra um, ATMS systems along uh, state roadways. Okay, thank you. Any, anybody have any questions from the uh, from the commission, um, or do I have a motion for approval? Move approval. Uh, may, may, maker of the motion was uh, Commissioner Long. Did I see here a second? Second. Okay, Thankfully. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Commissioner Seal. I want to um, thank Jacobs for for all his hard work. Okay. Yeah, well said. Thank you for that. Um, no other questions from the commission? Brian, you want to check with the public on item 23? Sure. At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on agenda item 20, 23, please raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting or hit star nine on the telephone. And Mr. Chairman, there are no members of the public that wish to speak on agenda item 23. Thank you, Brian. All in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? 
Motion carries unanimously. Move on to item 24, very under public works. Second item, this is federal uh, funding sub, -grant, uh, sub award and grant agreement with the Florida Department of Emergency Management, their hazard mitigation grant program. This will um, serve for a replacement of WAN, uh, span wired supported traffic signals with mass arm traffic signals. So this will be a hardening uh, of our infrastructure. Okay, thank you, Barry. Yes, Commissioner Welch. Thank you, just had a question. Um, Brian, can you pull the map up? Uh, it says project map. I don't know that I've been given that as part of the agenda prep, Commissioner Welch. Kelly's yeah. on the line. Kelly, you, she may be able to. Kelly oh, has- no, Sorry, it'd be Ken Jacobs. Yeah, we have Ken with us, sir. Can you see me? Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, what was the question? I'm sorry, I blacked out there for a second. Well, there's a project map in the backup materials. And I just had a, it shows where the improvements are going. And I just wondered in Clearwater and St. Pete, there's no project. Have they already been done? Is this a phased effort? Just wanted to know where we are. It's a phased effort. And uh, what we tried to do this time uh, uh, was to concentrate on the uh, evacuation routes off the beach and, and towards the east-west movement. So um, we, we continue to look for additional funding for this. We do have some funding for intersection improvements in the, in the penny. Uh, so uh, we'll continue as, as, uh, as we move forward to, to fund as many of these on county facilities as possible. Okay, and there's only one on Gulf Boulevard. Is the rest of Gulf Boulevard in good shape or? Uh, some are, some uh, still need to be done, but uh, a lot of it we had to reflect on what upcoming projects they might also have going on. Uh, several of the uh, key locations on Gulf Boulevard, the intersections with the, uh, the bridges across uh, the connection points have been recently done with mast arms. Okay, Ken. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hey Ken, uh, would this, if you have like, let's just say a dozen stars on there, these are the ones that we're talking about. How many others have been done, just as a, a kind of a rough number? Do you have a, do you have a sense of that? Uh, we're roughly about halfway. About half of our signals are mast arm, the other half are span wire. Uh, the okay. majority, uh, I would say the majority of the ones that are span wire still are off the major roadway systems. So anytime we do a, a major roadway project, uh, we upgrade those to mast arms. So uh, the uh, probably the biggest road that we have that still has mast arms is East Lake, uh, and that one we'll be uh, looking at in the next 10-year period to to make improvements out there, and we'll replace all those uh, span wire signals out there with mast arm. Okay, thank you. Anybody have any other questions? For Mr. Jacobs. Okay. I, yep. move Go ahead. If you don't have a motion, I'd move approval. No, that's fine. Commissioner Welch, thank you. Second. Thank you, Commissioner Long. Brian, you want to hear from, let's hear from the public on this at the, one. At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on agenda item 24, please raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting or hit star nine on the telephone. And Mr. Chairman, there's no one that wishes to speak on agenda item 24. Okay, um, then uh, commissioners all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, moving on to items 25 and 26. They're both under solid waste. Mr. Administrator. Item 25 is an agreement with Keep Fennell's Beautiful um, for the adopter program management services. It's a 36 month base contract. Okay. Move approval. Second. Does any of the commissioners have any comments or questions on this item? All right, uh, Brian, we'll check with the public on item 25. At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on agenda item 25, please raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting or hit star nine on the telephone. And Mr. Chairman, there's no one that wishes to speak on this item. Okay, thank you, Brian. Um, all in favor uh, of item number 25, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item 26, 
Mr. Mr. Sarian, your certificate for the Lowman Solid Waste Collection and Disposal Non um, Ad Valorem Assessment Board. Move approval. Second. Any questions of staff by the commissioners? Brian, can you check with the public, please? At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on agenda M26, please hit star nine on the telephone or raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting. And Mr. Chairman, there's no one that wishes to comment on agenda item 26. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries unanimously on to items 27, 28, 29, and 30, which are all under county attorney. Don, all yours. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, item 27 is initiation of litigation in the case of Pinellas County versus Christine Wilder. Uh, this is an action for the protection of an animal, uh, work of local law enforcement. Uh, this is a case to uh, take possession of an animal through the legal process. Move approval. Second from Commissioner Long. Uh, any, any questions, I guess, on this? If not, we'll go to the public comment, Brian. At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on agenda item 27, please hit star nine on the telephone or raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting. And Mr. Chairman, we have no one that wishes to comment. Okay, and then on item 27, commissioners, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item 28, Don. Item 28 is proposed initiation of litigation in the case of Anthony Knaver versus Bruce Mills. Uh, this is a uh, housing discrimination case um, that will be handled uh, through the Office of Human Rights. Okay. Anybody, any, yep, Commissioner Welch, thank you. We have a second from anybody? Second. Commissioner Long, a second. Any other comments or questions? If not, we'll go to the public, Brian. At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on agenda item 29, please hit star nine on the telephone or raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting. I think that's 20, 28. Oh, I'm sorry, 28, I apologize. Agenda item 28, please. And Mr. Chairman, there's no one that wishes to speak on agenda item 28. All right, hey, thank you. If I could uh, yeah. add one item, I'm sorry. Uh, I just wanted to point out that this is a ratification due to the uh, emergent nature of one of the items that was already taken uh, the chair had authorized us. This is ratification of the chair's action and authority. Well, I know, I'm number 28. Um, I'm sorry, no, that was on 27. I apologize. Okay, so. so um, are there any questions on that or does that change anybody's motions? Let's finish 28 real quick here. Um, do we, we had nobody on the, on the line for 28. Uh, all, uh, commissioners on number 28, all in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay, Don, back to 27. Sorry about that, Commissioner. Yes, uh, the, due to the urgent nature of the, uh, the legal action to take possession of the animal, that was approved by the chair for the county attorney board with filing that, and that was simply a ratification by the board and approval to continue that process. All right, well then let's, let's get a ratification uh, motion and a second, please. So moved. Okay. A second for, from Commissioner Peters. Okay, um, I guess we'll revisit that, uh, Brian, and see if there's anybody that now wants to discuss. I guess we have to ask for comment, public comment on that as well. At this time, if there's anybody from the public that wishes to comment on agenda item 27, uh, please hit star nine on the telephone or raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting. And Mr. Chairman, there's no one that wishes to speak. Okay, now on number 27 for ratification of the action uh, taken already. Everybody uh, say aye. Aye. In favor? Aye. Excuse me. Anybody opposed? Okay, that motion carries unanimously. On to number 29, Don. Yes, this is a resolution regarding the Pinellas County School Board's proposal uh, for a referendum question to continue to levy an additional one half mil. Um, this was previously approved by the board on uh, June 23rd, uh, but there was an error uh, that had subsequently been communicated to us, and this is uh, ratifying their um, current proposed referendum question for, to go on the ballot. 
Move approval. Second. Okay. Anybody have any questions on that item? Okay, Don, or Brian, excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Uh, at this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on agenda item 29, please hit star nine on the telephone or raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting. And Mr. Chairman, there's nobody that wishes to speak on agenda item 29. Okay, then on item 29, commissioners, all in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay, motion carries unanimously. And um, and finally, do you have any county other county attorney reports, Don? I just briefly, uh, it wasn't the last commission meeting, but the one before you had asked to talk about uh, bringing a, a letter forward to talk about uh, postponing some collection of ad valorem taxes uh, in talking through and working through this with uh, um, Brian Loak and, and some others. We were looking at the statutory processes. As the county administrator had alluded, it is a very statutorily driven process. The uh, property appraiser, tax collector, and clerk all have pieces of that. Uh, for the 2019 taxes, obviously those became payable in November of 2019. They became delinquent as of May 1st. And um, the actual tax certificates, which is part of the statutory process, were sold on all outstanding delinquent taxes as of the beginning of June. So that process had already happened and those certificates would have been bought by uh, different private individuals. Um, what I can tell you is that those uh, interest rates are typically very low. Uh, I believe one that I looked at, uh, particularly as to this this most recent one, it's bid at one quarter of one percent. Uh, those tax certificates cannot be brought for sale for two years, so they cannot be the, the property can't be sold for two years. Um, and as to the 2020 taxes, those tax bills have not gone out and won't go out until obviously uh, November of this coming year. Uh, and obviously you guys haven't even set millages for those yet. Um, and again, so we're kind of in a, at a place here, but I wanted to let you know, because we had talked about sending a letter that we're not sure exactly where or how we could intervene in that statutory process at this time. Um, it would take statu uh, legislative action and um, something you may want to be careful about considering is, is the cash flow for not only you, but all of the other taxing authorities that um, your ad valorem supports. But I did want to bring that back and not leave it uh, just open. Okay. Thank you. Any uh, any questions for Don? Okay. We'll go on to item 31. It's a county administrator's report. Commissioner, so we have two items uh, for you today. The first is a hurricane update, and Kathy Perkins is on the line, your emergency management uh, director. Hi, Kathy. Good morning, everybody. Hope you're doing well. We are. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, we've had a very busy season with a projection of between 13 and 19 named storms, six to 10 of those being hurricanes and three to six being major hurricanes. Uh, as you know, we're up to already nine named storms for the season with one on the cusp at 90% out there in the Atlantic now. Uh, we've had two named hurricanes this season and the tropics are really heating up. It's that time of year. But what I would always implore to people is that what this means for us is we always must remain vigilant and prepare for that one or several storms that could potentially impact us, no matter how many storms are protect, uh, predicted for the season. I'm gonna start off on a high note in telling you that between October and December, when we reassessed all of our shelters for capacity and suitability, uh, we finally reached our budget uh, book goal for shelter spaces. Yay, I'm so excited. Um, <laughs> we had gotten up to 44,000 shelter spaces um, and we were shooting for about 43,000. So we were very excited. We surpassed that goal and then COVID-19 happened. So what have we done over the last few months to prepare for hurricane season with the addition of COVID-19? So we had to set several goals going into the hurricane season. One was really identifying ways to make sure that we can provide for safe sheltering for an evacuation. We had to look to see, is it possible for us to reduce the number of people that we call to evacuate if able? We also wanted to see, can we increase the number of sites or options for sheltering? 
And we also needed to look at how we would change our operations at the emergency operations center if needed. Obviously, we couldn't cram that room full of people. So we started to look at how we do our evacuation process. One of the tools that we do have available to us is to look at storm surge from a smaller subset of storms that are called directional meows. The evacuation map that everyone is currently familiar with utilize overlays for all like category storms together, regardless of the direction of speed. So we know that we'll only get hit with one storm at a time. So if we lump all these directions and speeds together, that's been the standard. But what we want to do this year is to really look at a storm as, it, as it's approaching us from the direction and the speed. So we have a storm that if it's headed to us from Southeast Florida and it's going to the Northwest and it's an exiting storm, we know that there are certain areas in our county where we expect to have less storm surge than we would from an entering storm coming from the Gulf of Mexico and headed due East. So this will help us with looking at, can we reduce the number of people and increase the number of shelters that we would use? We'll also get additional information from the National Hurricane Center, which is known as the probabilistic surge. We get this about 48 hours before landfall. And this is a computation that they run using their supercomputers. This will be even more refined and it gives you a smaller footprint for where that inundation will be. But obviously for our larger storms where our evacuation clearance time is 44 hours, we can't always wait to get that data. So we'll use our best information from our directional meows and make critical decisions uh, as we can as we move forward. We did receive new surge data from the National Hurricane Center just for the Gulf of Mexico. They've been redoing their basins over the years to help um, differentiate how the storm surge would be uh, in different areas. Before they used to have separate basins, which made that a little bit more challenging. So since we received that data in early July, we've been updating that as part of our analysis. And we really are focusing on the impacts for the more inland areas for the C, D, and E evacuations. The challenge with making any modifications uh, to evacuation zones is how do we communicate this to the public? So we're currently working with our geographic information systems folks, and we'll be working with marketing and communications to really make sure we have the best approach on how we communicate this to the public, because we know that can be confusing. To give you an example of how this could impact our long-term care facilities, um, we have a facility that currently is in a de evacuation zone. So normally we would always tell that facility to evacuate for a category four storm. So we started to look at the different scenarios. If we look at one of the scenarios, even for a category five, which is above the level where we had expected to evacuate them, uh, for particular storms, they might not have any surge or they could have up to nine to 12 feet surge for an entering storm. So looking at this approach will really help us determine, is it safe for them to shelter in place? Because if we can minimize the number of people that we move from these vulnerable facilities, that will be critical. In terms of our shelter spaces, we needed to look at what we could do to provide as much spacing between individuals and family units as they come into a shelter. So we had to develop a plan for how we would divvy up all of that space. We looked at the composition of families that evacuated during Hurricane Irma to help us formulate what the allocation could be. So an individual coming in would get up to 60 square feet. Families with up to three people where we know that they've been living together, um, so it's safer for them to be closer, they would share that 60 square feet, still giving them that 20 square feet per person that we had planned for originally. Larger families would get slightly larger spaces incrementally, and then we would work to maintain a space in between all of those units as they come in. Our goal is to maximize the utilization while making sure that we keep safe distances between non-household groups. Uh, we're in really good shape through a category three storm for our spacing, and then after that, it will start to get a little tight. Uh, we will need to open more shelters than we have traditionally for each of the different storms. So to give you an idea, normally for a category one storm, we would only open six shelters. This year, we need to open about 14 of them. Uh, and, and that changes for each of our categories of storms. Using our analysis for the directional storms for our level D and E, when we look at our exiting storms, we can add three or four additional shelters for those different scenarios. So that gives us about another 
4,000 spaces uh, to put people in. So that direction of that storm is really critical in our decision-making process. We also encourage alternatives to shelters. So every year we encourage people to look, can they stay with family or friends outside of an evacuation zone? And we have been encouraging churches and businesses to look to see if they have suitable buildings that they can open up for employees or constituents for sheltering. In addition to our local measures, the state of Florida has been working with hotels statewide to be able to enter into contracts and open them up as what's known as non-congregate shelter locations. They're basically hotels that meet or exceed the 2002 building code, are outside of the evacuation area, have a transfer switch so you can add a generator, and have access to kitchen or feeding facilities. Uh, we did reach out to the Convention and Visitors Bureau and the Chambers to help us identify any local hotels that may be interested in supporting this endeavor. And there will be online access that will be made available to the public to help them select those options as well uh, as a storm is, is um, coming towards us. So Kathy, this, yeah. <laughs> on, the, on, on that, on those local hotels, I'm just assuming I mean, it's probably a silly question, but I'm just assuming we're not collecting the bed taxes on that, right? If those are used for emergency shelters? Uh, I don't have an answer to that. I'd have to ask about that. Okay. I mean, I know that that's been brought up in other situations, but I think this one's a little bit even more specific to it. So, and before you're finished with this, just make, I just want to make sure you, and you probably are going to, but touch on the volunteer requirements and that kind of thing. Thank you. Yeah. Certainly, thank you. Uh, some of the safety measures that we have put in place, uh, will have in place if we do have to open our shelters is we will do temperature and symptom screening at all of our shelter locations. For anybody that is exhibiting symptoms of COVID-19 or is confirmed to be COVID-19 positive, we would recommend you either shelter at home if it's safe to do so, or you can take advantage of the non-congregate shelter sites. So that way you are continuing with our social distancing. We have identified and have on hand PPE for all of our, sorry, personal protective equipment for all of our workers and additional masks for the public who may or may not have, or they, if they misplace them while they're at the shelter. We are increasing the cleaning schedules and hand sanitation stations at all of our shelter locations, and we'll have increased signage to remind people to follow the CDC guidance. Uh, we are identifying separate shelters for people that are COVID positive in case they cannot go to any of the non-congregate sites. And for those that may come in to uh, a shelter and we cannot move them safely due to the weather concerns, we'll identify separate areas within those shelters to be able to isolate them during the storm. So, Dr. Uh, Commissioner Eggers, you, you touched a little bit on staffing. Uh, so we did have a, a meeting uh, with schools uh, late July, and they did express some concerns with uh, their ability to be able to staff the shelters uh, and, you know, looking at how the model of other counties staff shelters. So we know that this is a concern with COVID-19 and not just for school employees, but even for volunteers, for the American Red Cross, even for our own employees in the county that normally help us support shelter operations. Um, so we want to make sure that we're working with as many partners and we, you know, let them know about what safeguards we have in place. So some of the things that we're doing to try to get additional people is uh, that we reached out through the sheriff's office. Uh, he has identified, I think, 51 people as of yesterday uh, that are non-sworn um, that would be willing to volunteer in shelters. Uh, we have uh, 53 people within the county uh, UPS already that we know of that will help in shelters. And then we're really trying to identify up to about 400 people to help us cover that shelter management and shelter support positions. And what that entails is, you know, working closely with the school principal and the facility managers that are on site, uh, you know, to make sure that the building is being utilized properly uh, to help with registration as people come in and the screening, as you heard me just talk about. And then during the shelter operation, just making sure that people are complying um, with the rules that we have at the shelter, making sure that people are getting fed, helping out um, with any directions or anything that we do need to do and giving information information to people during the storm itself at the shelter location. We'll also be reaching out to businesses and our faith-based partners as well as we continue to seek additional support uh, for this important operation. 
So some of the things that we've been doing too, we've been looking at mitigation projects for shelters. That's always important for us. Um, so we identified actually four schools uh, with projects that will run about $350,000 and it will add an additional 1,550 shelter spaces of which 624 of those would be for our special needs population at a site that has generator backup capacity. Uh, we're also in discussions with uh, Pinellas County Schools in relation to two major construction projects that they have coming up so we can add enhanced hurricane protection areas uh, to the schools to increase our shelter capacity as well. We continue to work with the state on engineering reviews of additional community centers for use as at-risk shelters and then also looking at those as step-down shelters uh, to relieve schools after the storm has passed. So we'll continue to look at that. We're looking at opportunities uh, that can support for funding, whether it's through state mitigation monies. Uh, there's the CDBG, the Community Development Block Grant Disaster Relief monies that have ma been made available. And then we also have identified some penny monies to help us work on projects as they're identified. Uh, one of the projects that we've been working on over the last year is to install a generator at the Leelman Exchange. Uh, we do anticipate this to uh, be hooked up early October, so we're looking forward to being able to get that completed. Some of the things that we've done in terms of our technology advances, so if, if you've got the Ready Pinellas app on your phone, we have added push notifications to that. So we'll be able to send out real-time notifications to the public for anybody ha that has that application on their phone. Uh, we developed a Pelican application. This is a mapping platform, and this was developed with our, our GIS folks. That will allow us to turn on and off layers so we can do analyses uh, based upon the situational data that we need to look at. So this will include directional storms, critical facilities, uh, and we're incorporating as many county map layers as we can, any of our historical flood information, uh, we can have live data in there as well, such as information from the National Weather Service, from the National Hurricane Center, river gauges. So having this kind of platform is really valuable to us and it'll benefit many other county departments as well. Um, some of the new boards that we've created in our Web EOC system, uh, we have a storm lead time board that will help us uh, keep track of the many activities that we need to accomplish before a storm makes landfall. Uh, Cause obviously for the different magnitude of storms that come before us, we have different time frames for all of our activities. So we wanna make sure that we've got a, a good way to be able to track that and stay on top and ahead of all of those activities. Mm -hmm. We also updated our shelter board to help us account for our activation scenarios. Uh, there may be some differences in some of the shelters that open this year, as you heard me talk up a little bit earlier, we'll probably need to open more shelters than we have traditionally. So we don't want people to say, hey, those are the shelters that opened during Hurricane Irma. It may be different this year. So it's really important that people continue to monitor uh, information on our emergency bulletin board, uh, the Know Your Zone board on the app as well. So we're feeding all of our Web EOC board information real time into a number of uh, venues to be able to make sure that the public has the most recent information in terms of what is opening up. Uh, we've added an EM supply board to our tracking software within Web EOC. Uh, this will really help us tie together what we have in stock, what's coming in and what's being requested. So we're implementing that now. Um, and, and this is the type of system that will really help us. I mean, as you know, for COVID-19, um, we've had millions of items uh, come through our logistics processing system. So this will really help us uh, make sure that we're able to real time see where everything is and see how we can move things around to meet the needs that are out there. We are making upgrades to the unified call system at the county level. So this will give us a call tree to provide options for people that are calling in to the county information center. So it'll be pre-recorded information, uh, direct you to web links, or you can choose to speak to a live operator. We're working on both pre and post scenarios, uh, as well as other options for different types of events. Our public outreach was obviously impacted this year with COVID-19. We do have all three languages of our hurricane guide online and available in print. So English, Spanish, and Vietnamese are out there in the community. 
We've really leveraged all of the technology um, from Zoom to Teams uh, to all of our webinars uh, to continue our outreach. We moved into phase two of our educational and outreach to our mobile home parks. Uh, we're working with Pinellas Park and Largo Fire Departments for an August awareness campaign. Uh, we did send out 47,000 door hangers again this year. Uh, again, really stressing hurricane and tornado safe safety, and then also encouraging those folks to prepare their yards before a storm. YouTube has allowed us to extend our outreach capacity. Uh, so we've done some real-time webinars. We had a faith-based community group webinar. We had 32 people that were able to attend live, and then an additional 95 that were able to watch it on YouTube later on. So this has really helped us in terms of our outreach and be able to reach people when maybe the times are not convenient for them. Uh, we continue to, to reach out to our business community. We held a business summit uh, with economic development and some other partners. Um, and as a result of that summit, uh, 26 people learned their evacuation zone, 52 people signed up for Alert Pinellas and 41 businesses started a business plan. Uh, we recently distributed 1,500 hurricane hygiene kits uh, at Tarpon Springs and High Point and Leelman, and this include Included rain ponchos, soap sanitizer, bug spray, tarps, duct tape, batteries, and of course our hurricane guide. So we continue to do as much outreach as we can. Um, maybe not as fun as some of the face-to-face -face stuff that we used to do, but we're making sure that we continue to reach out. And then just to give you an idea through some of the work that we've done with our faith-based community, um, we've had 17 additional faith-based providers sign up for our built our billboard emergency alert system. So that's a great system where you're driving down the street and, and you can see on their billboard if we're putting out emergency messages to the community. So we've identified 24 additional food pantries, uh, four extra delivery trucks who can help us with food, 26 additional commercial kitchens, uh, 23 spiritual uh, counselors, uh, people that are can help us, 26 people that can help with the wellness check capabilities. So COVID-19, though it has posed a lot of challenges for us, it has built a, a lot of relationships uh, for us. So as we continue to move through this hurricane season, uh, we know it's a challenge. I just want to you know, tell people to please use those three tenants that we always tell you. That's to know your risk, make a plan, and stay informed. Uh, it's getting into the busy time of the season. Put together your plans. If you need help from people, reach out to your neighbors, reach out to the many wonderful service providers that are out there. You know, if you have special needs and you need help, sign up on our registry now so we know about you and we can identify the resources to be able to get to you. Um, it's not a time to panic, it's a time to be prepared. I don't wanna discourage people from evacuating. Um, storm surge is life-threatening. If you are electric dependent or you live in a mobile home, um, wind can be life-threatening for you as well. So please make a plan. If you need to come to the public shelters, know that you know we've got many systems in place to help to protect you uh, and we'll make those non-congregate sites available to you as well. You can see, Commissioner, she's been very, very, very busy. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I also just wanted to add, babe, before you open up the comment, we have also reached out to our cities. That is another key partner. We'll be reaching out to them in our in our um, uh, special districts, recreation districts, and others for assistance and staffing, um, because it's it really is going to take a community. If she needs 400 people. You know, we start, and you know, initially people were like, "Well, the county can do that, right?" Well, when you start pulling out that utilities is busy. Public Works is busy, 911's busy, you know, our building inspectors are doing damage assessment right after, you know, pretty pretty num you know, soon that number dwindles. So so we're gonna uh, we're gonna do an all hands uh, approach and uh, build on the community partnerships that have you know been so successful. Um, so again I, I did speak with the city managers uh, last Friday and we'll be doing follow up with them. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. And I and I just really wanted to make a comment. We uh, I said at the beginning that I uh, wanted to thank our staff members uh, that have stepped up and done great things. And um, <clears throat> I think one of our unsung heroes is Kathy. Um, I can't I can't imagine where we'd be without you and your team. 
Um, it's just been, it's, it's, I, it's so reassuring to know that the logistical issues of this county, whether it's under the pandemic issue, which is an incredible amount of work that's been done, um, PPE, you know, acquisition. I don't even want to get into it because I'm going to sell you short on all the things that your group has been doing. But, but now transitioning so smoothly into the hurricane season three or four months ago, um, thank you. Um, just, just great work. And I know the commission here is very proud of you and your team, Barry. Just, uh, just thank you for 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 her and for everybody around that group. I, I'm. Really, really impressed with our uh, with our team there. So thank you, Kathy. Pass that along to to your to everybody, Commissioner. Thank Welch. you. I will. It's a great team. They're a pleasure to work with, and we've had a lot of support from other county departments too. Um, just to give you an idea, we've filled 3,252 missions uh, just for uh, COVID-19, mm -hmm. and we're at a 99.8 percent fulfillment. So uh, we've really caught up in terms of the supplies that people needed, uh, really working very closely with our long-term care facilities, making sure that they have that PPE. So if they do have cases flare up, um, their employees are prepared. Yeah, I, just amazing the number of number of things you've got to put your hands on to get to take care of the issues that we're having to deal with. So uh, Commissioner Welch. Yeah, just totally echo the chairman's comments and PPE is just one example, you know, just listening to those uh, 8 a.m. calls and, and you talking about getting PPE to health providers around the county and you call it missions. I just love your approach to it. Um, just want to thank you for the great work you're doing, Kathy. A couple of questions on your um, and your entire team. A couple of questions on what you talked about. You gave an example of previously for a cat one, we needed six shelters and now we need something like 13. I was trying to follow your notes. Can you send us just a summary for each category, what the previous requirement was and where we are now um, in terms of shelters? Yeah, I'll be happy to send that to you okay. um, to give you that analysis. And, and even since the beginning of hurricane season, as we started to do that directional analysis, we've been able to add um, some additional shelters back in. So, and I, and I know it's a silly question because you wouldn't be recommending it if you didn't have faith, but I just want to ask, these new tools, you know, the probabilistic surge and the directional analysis, you've got faith that we can implement those now and decrease decrease the number of folks that have to evacuate. It's, it's a tried and true technology. Yes, uh, we actually, I started using this in Miami-Dade uh, back in, I think, 2013 or 2014. Um, okay. So, you know, our situation down there is at, at one point, I think we had to evacuate 1.9 million people for a Category 5 storm. Um, and knowing that not all storms are created equal, uh, as we started to do that analysis, we actually found for some Category 5 storms that your evacuation footprint is more like a Category 3. So it really depends upon the speed that is coming towards you and that direction. Um, you know, so it's hard because from a, a public communication point of view, it's much easier for us to say, here's your static evacuation zones. Right. People can memorize their zone and they'll know that. So this makes it a little bit more tricky. So we have to make sure that we've got that communication piece down. Uh, you know, for zones A and B, they're the closest ones to the coast. They're gonna be at the highest risk for storm surge. Uh, we're probably not gonna make any modifications to those this year. It's those ones that are a little bit further inland uh, that we, you know, want to take a closer look at. We want to make sure, and, you know, we will do this with extreme due diligence. I'm not going to uh, make a decision if I think there's a risk for somebody there. And the thing with the way they run these models, and I don't want to get too technical, but even those directional meows that you heard me talk about, that's still hundreds of storms laid on top of each other. So you could have a storm that's actually on the east coast of Florida that's headed to uh, the Northwest, and it's not hitting us directly. So the chances of us getting storm surge from that are very low, as opposed to one that's on top of us or one that's out in the Gulf of Mexico headed that same direction. 
Um, so it does make a big difference. Um, you know, we'd love to be able to get to the point where we don't evacuate more people than we have to, but as emergency managers, it's our job to err a little bit on the side of caution. I'd rather apologize to you for making you evacuate and having you have that inconvenience than have to apologize to your family members for Absolutely. not issuing the evacuation order and then heaven forbid something happened to you. Well, thank you. It's good to hear your experience with that with that model. And I know I'm setting myself up com for Commissioner Justice to harass me, but you said directional meow several times. What does that stand for? So it's the maximum envelope of waters. Maximum envelope of waters. Okay. Yes, yeah, not a bunch of cats. Well, <laughs> you know, I, I'm just setting him up. I know it, but I had to ask what that was. And the last question was um, on your, um, you said if someone is COVID-19, positive, they're going to go to a separate shelter. Are those shelters exclusively for COVID-19 folks or are they mixed? They will be exclusively for, we're working with the health department. So those people that we know that are currently di diagnosed and, or in their, and their family members, um, we'll be working with them to make that contact and let them know which is that site for them to go to if they need that shelter option. Uh, the non-congregate sites, uh, the hotels that the state are doing, those will be great options as well because then they can at least have their family together in a hotel room. Okay. Thank you so much, Kathy. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Any, uh, anybody else that uh, has any questions for Kathy? Okay. Um, I, I don't see anybody else, but again, Kathy, thank you for, uh, well, you bring a wealth of experience from, you know, South Florida, which is, which was great to begin with, but just watching you over the last year and a half, uh, and then specifically this year, um, I think our residents can feel confident that we're in good hands. So thank you again. Really appreciate that, uh, that leadership and your knowledge, your experience and all of that, uh, to make us uh, a little safer. So. Thank you. Um, I, I, I wish I could not be in front of you all the time. So <laughs> hopefully we'll get a respite soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Commissioner Welch. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Just one last one. Um, special needs shelters, any changes there? I think we still have the same special needs shelters in terms of the screening. Yes. Yeah, so for COVID-19 for the special needs shelters, we're actually working with the community health center. Uh, you heard Dr. Cho talk about those rapid tests uh, because we know this is a much higher vulnerable population for COVID-19. Our goal is to do the rapid tests as they are coming in. Uh, we're working with our fire districts and with the schools. Uh, we believe we'll have to increase the number of buses that we use to go out and help transport those folks so we can socially distance them. We'll make sure that we have masks for them as they get on the bus as well. Um, so we're, we're working through that um, to make sure that we have that in place. And then also looking to see if we can get additional nurses um, to have in there to help with screening and to help monitoring that population. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, anybody else? Uh, Barry, you had you said you were gonna you're gonna talk about yes, care. Second item is, is uh, care sec funding, and so we have Aubrey, Aubrey Phillips. Oh, sorry. Yeah, let me ask you. Let me ask you a question. Just as far as presentation and time, um, what's your kind of guesstimate here? Oh, this shouldn't take long. We're just gonna go through the outline of the program and kind of show you where each component piece is and how they're rolling it out. Okay. All right. So okay, 10, 10 minutes, Aubrey. Okay. Go. Ahead. Perfect. Yep. I know I'm between everybody and lunch, but I know that everyone's interested in this update. So um, you all know we did expand the um, individual and fin families financial assistance um, in, on July 7th. With that expansion, we streamlined the program. We have seen that improve um, the speed at which we're getting financial assistance payments made. Uh, through August 7th, 5.5 million in financial assistance payments have been issued. Um, and we've actually seen an increase month over month from May to July of 600% in terms of the amount of uh, financial assistance payments we're getting out. Um, we've also seen the number of households being assisted double between May and June. However, there is a lag in July reporting, so we don't have those complete numbers for July yet, but that's something we'll continue to monitor, making sure that those um, assistance to the households are getting processed and paid out. Then you um, 
likely are aware, we've seen continued high monthly call volumes approaching 25,000 calls or more per month. Um, that's led to callers experiencing wait times of 10 minutes or more and a high percentage of calls being abandoned by the caller before they're able to be answered. So there've been a few um, areas of movement related to um, those performance. We're really prioritizing getting the uh, financial assistance payments issued. As I mentioned, staff training and experience have helped to reduce the average talk time. Um, so the, long, the shorter amount of time that a caller needs to be on the phone with a representative allows that representative to reach more callers. Um, however, a significant portion of those 25,000 calls per month are a result of households that are following up to check on a status of a case in progress. The telephone is not how um, uh, individuals or families request assistance. That's done through um, the 211 texting number. Um, so we're getting a lot of follow-up on cases that are in progress. So we're really uh, emphasizing and strengthening resources there to process those applications more quickly. Um, we're continuing to work with 211 to monitor that and see if we're seeing the improvements we're looking for or take additional action as needed. Um, case reviewers have been added, about 13 of them, and by addressing that case review backlog, we're anticipating that we'll reduce the overall call volumes and help to improve wait times for callers. Last week, we launched two new programs, nonprofit support and licensed child care facilities. So those two programs combined provide about 35 million in total out to um, nonprofit organizations, specifically those that are addressing basic needs. So our feeding agencies, um, nonprofits focused on homelessness and behavioral health, as well as legal aid for housing, um, so that as uh, the COVID pandemic continues and we have more folks in a tenuous housing situation, they're able to get legal assistance um, to work with their uh, landlord or mortgage company. Um, the 4.6 million for childcare organizations is supporting those organizations that are open and serving children. Um, so again, that program launched on Friday. And as of yesterday, we had 172 applications that have been submitted. 51 of those have been submitted for payment um, and that's totaling about $365,000. So those two are moving forward and gaining momentum and really addressing some of the underlying needs that came up when we did public input um, that weren't being addressed through our existing programs. Audrey, also, Audrey, yep. Audrey that, that, that 172 applicant, was that just for the licensed child portion or is that for the nonprofit and the license? That is just for the child care portion. Um, we're managing through that, that through neighborly, the same system we use for the small business. So I have direct access to those numbers. Um, I will get you all updated numbers on the nonprofit support. Okay, great. Thank you, Audrey. Um, and then on the county and city COVID mitigation and response, we are moving forward with making uh, 8.4 million um, available to cities uh, allocated by population. Uh, we, are, we will be meeting with cities later this week, um, but we know that they've had um, impacts related to COVID response and mitigation. And we're coordinating a webinar with the cities um, to help coordinate between the city and the county on our COVID funding strategy and making sure that we're able to get um, leverage the federal dollars that are available um, to help address the needs of the population here in Pinellas County. And commissioners, if you recall back, the way we're approaching that is to provide the 12.5%, which is the local match for the theme of dollars. Um, so we're getting that money out the door. We There are other COVID that are not FEMA reimbursements that we'll address, but we've asked the cities, that let's see how these other programs go and the funding that's available. And so there may be, we may be able to address some of their uh, non-FEMA re reimbursements at a later date, dependent upon the utilization of the other programs. Uh, so we're kind of taking it in two batches. They were um, good comments. Everybody uh, understands the need to get the money out in the community first, um, and then we'll, we'll address some of those other uh, related issues. And to the point about getting money out in the community, um, one of the ways that we've been doing that ongoing has been through our public health mitigation response. So the CARES Act allocation has been helping to support the two drive-through community-based COVID testing sites that have been up and operating, um, as well as helping to procure the 90-day PPE supply stockpile. We're about 85 to 90 percent of the way complete on that initial 90-day supply, um, and that's making sure that we've got the resources here that we can respond um, as needed. 
Um, we're also moving forward with agreements with uh, the Florida Department of Health in Pinellas County and the community health centers to support the COVID-19 testing and contact tracing that those agencies have undertaken. Launching later in August to the question that you brought up earlier this morning, Commissioner Eggers, um, we are looking to launch uh, the, a workforce reemployment training and job placement program through CareerSource Pinellas. That agreement is in review and we're hoping that that'll launch um, either next week or the following week, along with um, arts nonprofits. And so a point of clarification here, because it's a little bit different than you saw it in the overview that you all uh, approved back on July 7th, um, to provide clarity for applicants, we've peeled off the arts nonprofit organizations from the professional artists and arts creative businesses. That's allowing us to have one business application portal um, that meets uh, the needs and allows anyone to, uh, business owners to apply for any of the local business grants and keeps um, it clear that that's not the, the spot to apply if you're a nonprofit. Um, so we are looking to move forward with the arts nonprofits. Those are um, programs that support community-facing nonprofit arts organizations that have been impacted by COVID. Uh, we're developing that agreement now and hoping to launch that, if not next week, the following week. And then the, the piece that's been the um, biggest labor of love, I think, of my life so far, other than raising my son, has been our local <laughs> business grant program. Um, we've seen such tremendous collaboration, both with our external community partners and across county departments and agencies, um, with the clerk's office and economic development. That program we are looking to launch, um, shooting for the week of the 24th of August. Um, we have taken some extra time to develop that program to make sure that it's a single, simple application uh, portal for businesses. One of the things we heard very loud and clear when we did public input is that business owners were overwhelmed, they were stressed out, and they were not understanding where to apply and what different programs were available. And so we didn't want to further complicate and add to that um, feeling of stress and overwhelm that our business owners were feeling. So we've um, taken time to align these different grant programs um, to include a sliding scale grant that should address most business needs, um, but also business diversity and arts micro grants. So particularly for some of our solo entrepreneurs, newer businesses, professional artists and arts creative businesses that might not meet the, the requirements of many federal and state aid programs. Um, we wanted to make sure that there was a path for those kinds of businesses to develop capacity so that not only can they get some assistance through Pinellas Cares, but they're better um, positioned to qualify for future state and federal funding as well. And we feel like that's a really important part of this program and making sure that our businesses are sustainable and resilient um, moving forward. Last portion of the local business grant program is health and safety matching grants, which we've mentioned to you before. These are for our target industry businesses matching up to $10,000 in investments they've made related to COVID related upgrades and safety precautions. Um, so the way that we've structured the program, there is a single application. We've worked to simplify it as much as possible and a business can apply in one spot and be considered for all of those programs. They would be eligible to receive uh, one of the grants, um, but we're working with a primary uh, program administrator who would help to evaluate which program uh, would provide the best fit for that particular business. Um, we are working with uh, a primary program administrator um, who we uh, are in negotiations and developing an agreement with now. We have a kickoff meeting and planning meeting scheduled for this Friday and um, are working, uh, getting letters of interest responses back for our business diversity micro grant partner and agreement is in development with Creative Panels for the arts micro grants. So I know that, um, you know, there were some comments made earlier. I know people are hurting. We all feel that I've never seen such unity around a mission to get money out to businesses and people who are hurting. Um, but we did feel like it was important to take the time to do it right and not add to the confusion that, that business owners are feeling right now. Alongside with the launch of that local business grant program are um, Pinellas Cares Navigators. We did host orientations on both the financial assistance for individuals and families, as well as businesses. We have found some gaps in capacity for navigator coverage. And just to 
back up and, and refresh everybody's memory because I know there's a lot flying at all of us too. Um, those navigators are nonprofit, uh, typically community partners who um, as part of their mission are already out there helping businesses and individuals um, access and find the resources that are available to help them. We wanted to make sure we understood what kind of capacity um, those agencies had existing and to make sure we were communicating with them clearly about what programs are and will be available through Pinellas Cares. Um, so we have seen some gaps in that their capacity and we're working with those partners to um, beef up capacity there and make sure that business owners and individuals have access to navigators to help them access these programs. Is that all? <laughs> I tried Aubrey, to talk really fast wow. because I know everyone's hungry. No, no, Aubrey, thank you. Um, if you could, if there's a like a one page or two pages that could summarize all these programs in just a brief sentence or two on what they are um, and the funding that's being allocated at least up front for each of those and then kind of just, I know you have an accounting, you're, you're, you're going, we have $170 million, so we're working away on that list, but just an idea of where we are. Um, with the programs that you guys have uh, come uh, come forward with, and then and then the other thing, um, I I said earlier that you know that uh, the workforce piece that uh, and you talked about career source and AM skills was mentioned in that as well. So just wanted to put that out there as a not to answer the question today, but just kind of look in to see if there's an avenue there or a need there that can be identified, um, and then. Have you heard, I, I, we had a, a conference call in, uh, with Oldsmar's Chamber of Commerce uh, Board of Trustees uh, and uh, Congressman Bill Arrakis was involved in that. And I asked him about the possibility of extending this deadline that's 1231, I think of this year um, beyond that. And his initial comment was, Mike, I, he would think that he could get real support for that and that they would look into that. Have you heard anything about that at all? Uh, any efforts along those lines? Yeah, movement at the at the federal level on legislation is definitely something we stay closely tuned into. Um, Treasury frequently releases updated guidance as well as watching what's happening in the legislature. Um, there has been discussion from what I understand about moving out the deadline that hasn't been um, approved yet. So we are still moving forward, um, operating under our understanding that all of the funds will need to be spent by December 30th. But you bring up an, an excellent point that, um, you know, the, the CARES Act provided funding, not just through this $170 million direct allocation to Pinellas County, but through a number of other um, programs. And there's definitely some interplay between the different federal funding sources um, that staff throughout the county are working to navigate and, and make sure that we're leveraging the available um, allocations as best as possible. Okay, great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> any questions for us? Oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm just saying that's that's all that for, for my report. Okay. But, any other any questions before we let Aubrey go? I can't see all the commissioners, but okay. Um, I think we are winding down quickly here. Thank you all for bear, you know hanging in there to get through this before lunch, and then you have the rest of your day for whatever else you might need. Um, so I have just uh, item 32, which is a a reappointment or, a, or appointment to the Pinellas County Housing Authority. And then the final thing would just be anything new that you all wanna bring up. Um, so we'll move on to item 32. Jeanette, do you have that? Jeanette, oh, you're sorry. muted. Oh. Oh, I thought you said Hi. I was muted. No, not you, Mr. <laughs> Chair. <laughs> I'm so used to that. Hi, um, item 32 is an appointment or reappointment for the Pinellas County Housing Finance Authority. The ballot reflects three qualified candidates with one Mr. Bell or Beal, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, who would, if chosen, be a reappointment. Uh, the three applicant names for the record are Stephen T. Bell, uh, Pamela M. Harvey, Bill S. Uh, Sheen, and uh, we just need to select one. So I would recommend a uh, uh, either a, a nomination or a voice vote, um, however you'd like to proceed with that, sir. Okay, I saw, I saw Commissioner Welch's hand first. Go ahead, Commissioner Welch. I would move Stephen Beal. Second. Okay, uh, Commissioner Peters. That was me just trying to make a motion or a second, sir. 
Okay. Uh, Commissioner Seal, did you have anything additional? No, seconding it. Okay. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, all right. So we certainly have all in favor of uh, Stephen Beal being uh, reappointed. Uh, yes, Commissioner Peters. I'm sorry. I think she was voting. Mr. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, all in favor of, of supporting uh, Stephen Beal for reappointment, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, Stephen Beal will be reappointed to the Pinellas County Housing Authority for another uh, term. Um, finally, we are just at the end. Uh, any county commission new business? Anybody have anything for the uh, for the group? Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, I Commissioner. I, I don't want to. In the in the out of respect for time, I don't want to. We labor it today, but I would like an opportunity at our uh, next workshop to bring you all up to date on the mental health program that the Moroni Foundation implemented so that okay. you are up to speed. I think that might be meaningful. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Well, then uh, we are finished. Uh, Barry, any final comment or you 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 finished as well? I'm um, finished a few, unless you have a question. Right. Nope, nope, ready to go to work, I know. Um, all right, guys, thank you for everything and we'll talk soon. We're adjourned. Thank you, Chairman. Yep. Thank you.